time and space in galaxies unknown. From ages past, you've given us a name before the mountains were lifted from the plains. Oh, I'm running home where the love is always greater than my failures ever were. But all that matters now is my heart of surrender to the God who always takes my pain and turns it for good. You turn. Fathers run to wayward sons with heavenly embrace. It's where the orphan finally finds a name. It's where you love us all the same. Can you guys hear me? Okay, so we were gonna have this downstairs in a smaller space, so you would all have to be close if we were downstairs. And so because of that, we're asking you all to move up a little bit, and I realize most of you have, but, but, but what I'd like to do is take 60 seconds, and if you're a guest, we welcome you. I'd like you to stand and turn around and say hi to some folks, okay? And, but if you're toward the back and you would be willing to fill in some of these pockets, that would be great. The closer you are, the better your view. So come on down. Yes, sir. Okay, come on down. We're going to get started. Grab your spot. Derek and Stephen, we could probably open the uh, front few rows of, this, of these sections. If, if folks would, would like to sit across the aisle, that would be great. Um, come on in and grab your spot. If you're joining us online, I know a lot of folks are joining us online, and uh, we're so glad that we can live stream, so welcome. I never in my wildest imaginations envisioned there would be this much, much interest in this event, um, both, both here at our church and then outside of our church. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted though. I love to do this. I love to talk about these trips. So you guys ready to go to Israel? Yeah. <laughs> the safe way. <laughs> this is the, uh, this is the uh, those of us that don't wanna be involved in war, this is the way. 
Wave at me if you're a guest today, if, this is, if you came with a friend. Wow, well, let's welcome all these folks to Emmanuel. <clears throat> we are so glad that you're here. Hope you've got your coffee and your pastries and all the stuff you need. So let me tell you, uh, let me give you the lay of the land here real quick. In fact, let's pray, okay? Let's start with prayer and, uh, and then we're gonna jump in. We've got, this is like a pastor's, like me, a dream come true, three hours to talk. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is like, I might just do this every Saturday, just, just for the fun of it. I don't have a clock, I've, and we'll stop for restroom breaks, but, but then we'll come right back and we'll pick it up where we left off. Uh, this is just a dream come true for me. So uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Lord, we love you, thank you for uh, your word, and thank you for the story of the gospel and the grace of the gospel. Thank you that because of your grace, we can know you, we can be saved. And as we look at the geography today, as we look at uh, these sites and this land, as we get our brains into the, the locations of the story, help us to not lose sight of what you did in these places for us. And I pray that will be uh, just dominant in our hearts and minds. I pray that we will fall more in love with you. I pray that we'll leave here with a better and a more robust understanding of scripture and uh, just, just what is this book that we call the Bible? That, what is this story that you are writing? And uh, help us to have a better sense of our place in it. And if there's anybody here or online that doesn't know you personally as Savior, that they're maybe tied to performance-based religion or other ideas or philosophies, I pray today that the gospel would be clear as we go through uh, this journey and what you've done for us as a gift of grace, that uh, our salvation cannot be earned or achieved, but it can be received as a gift. And we thank you most of all for that. So I pray that you'll uh, guide my words and, and, and give me a direction and clear thought flow as we talk this morning and bless our time together, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so in between, during breaks, <clears throat> we put up three maps. Uh, the far map over here is Galilee. We're gonna talk about all these regions. This is a map of the entire nation of Israel, and it's broken up by uh, kind of first century regions and who was governing in different regions. This map, I'm gonna actually give you a version of this in a few minutes for you to keep. This is Old City Jerusalem in the first century, and we're gonna find our place on the maps in a few minutes, and we're gonna explore all that over the coming hours. But I just want you to know that that's what's here on the maps. On the table, I've brought several things, some things we're gonna hand out to you, but there's five copies of a journal that we give out on our trips to Israel. And I would ask you not to Take them, but feel free to borrow them, okay? So if you wanna look through, there's, there's just a lot of information in those journals. There's some books that I've picked up along the way, photo books, one of them's about Israel, one of them's about Jerusalem. The thing I love about these books, and you may actually um, wanna order them for yourself, they, especially after today, they are, uh, every site we're gonna talk about, plus a many that we won't, <clears throat> but it's a modern picture and an older picture. So you can see, you know, like, like, like one photo is 100 years old and one photo is a couple years old, and it goes through all the sites. And that's uh, the nation of Israel and also the city of Jerusalem. This is the, a book on the seven churches of Revelation. This would be in modern day Turkey. And we're not gonna talk much about that. We may have to do a second seminar where we talk about journeys of Paul and maybe the Exodus. I'd like to get to some of the Exodus today, but, and then these pages we're gonna hand out in a little while. <clears throat> I'm also, my throat is still waking up this morning, and I've been, battling all winter, just light congestion. Doesn't mean I'm sick, I don't think I'm gonna make you sick, but uh, if I have to clear my throat, you bear with me. Okay, so now, the other thing we're gonna do today, uh, I'm gonna be bouncing between photos, and most of these, I mean all but two or three are photos that I took on different trips. Um, photos, I had 8,000 photos. <clears throat> I spent no less than 10 hours this week. You know, my, my idea, this was Linda's idea, and, and she said, could we do this on a Saturday morning? I thought, yeah, probably 30 people will show up, and I'll just go through a few of my photos from Israel, and we'll just talk, and then like 200 of you signed up, and then a bunch of people online, and, uh, and I'm like, oh, I better get serious about this. Um, 
So I took all these photos and spent about 10 hours this week going through literally 8,000 photos. You're, not, you're only gonna see a handful of those that I, I thought were more important than others. Um, but we're gonna bounce between the photos and Google Earth, okay? And so you may wanna jot down locations because Google Earth is free and you can call that up on your computer or your big screen and you can look at these sites on your own. I think what I'd like to do today as much as anything else is equip you to do some of this research and uh, there's some great stuff on YouTube about these sites, people that have gone to these sites and, and done documentaries about them. And so, um, and so we're, gonna, we're gonna jump into it. Um, I put up here, and I'm gonna kind of probably bounce between screens here, and I've got a pointer too. Can you guys see my green dot? Let me show you my really good pointer. Here we go, look at that one. <laughs> I got a big red hand. Um, so anyway, um, we're gonna start with uh, just an overview very quickly of the Middle East as it pertains to scripture, okay? Um, so I'll use my pointer, and what we're looking at here is Egypt, um, the Red Sea, Gulf of Aqaba, and then as you go north, you got Sinai Peninsula, modern-day Israel, obviously Mediterranean, Turkey, Greece. Uh, as you go north, you've got Lebanon, Syria, Jordan to the east of Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, okay? So the Bible story most likely begins <clears throat> about right there. Um, and when I say begins, I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. Um, let me just zoom in a little bit. And I hope I don't, if I start to make you guys sick with the motion, let me know, okay? Uh, because I'll go a little slower. I'm just going to be zooming in and out and kind of doing a bunch of different stuff. So a lot of people believe that the Garden of uh, Eden was right here. We know for sure that Abram lived in Ur, which is right about here. So Abram was more Babylonian than anything else. Um, and God called him out of Ur, north, and away from his uh, country and kindred, up into a land called Haran, or Haran, however you've heard it pronounced. And so Abraham traveled up the Fertile Crescent, and he settled in Haran, which is up somewhere in here, right at the intersection of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. Also, this is the, this is the location of ancient Nineveh, just north of Mosul, Iraq, literally right across the river from Mosul are the ruins of Nineveh. So Babylon is down here outside of Baghdad. Nineveh's up here outside of Mosul. Abraham has settled there. And then God called him, as we know in Genesis, to a land. He said, follow me. Abraham said, where? And he said, I'll, I'll let you know later. Um, and he followed the Lord down the Fertile Crescent, out of, this is also called Mesopotamia, out of Mesopotamia into, in Abraham's day, what was called the land of Canaan, which we know as modern day Israel, all this area along the border of the Mediterranean Sea. So Abraham, Isaac, Abraham has a son, Isaac, Jacob, um, their stomping grounds, if I, if I can just give you your orientation, everybody okay on the motion? Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the screen with my green pointer here. Um, so the land of Israel, you have the northernmost area is Galilee up in here and the Sea of Galilee. You have the Jordan River Valley, which is below sea level. It's actually an earthquake. Uh, it's, it's a fault line that comes down to the Dead Sea. The further south you go, the more desert it becomes. It's very fertile and lush and green up here for the most part. And uh, it, then when you come to the, a little bit to the west, you go uphill. And the spine of the country, kind of actually from Haifa all the way down through Jerusalem, down to Beersheba, in, in a bit of a crescent shape, there's a spine of mountains. And that's called the hill country, it's called Samaria, it's called Judea. Um, so everything Everything east of that line becomes more desert and it goes downhill very quickly uh, to the point where you're below sea level. Everything west of that peak or that spine is still fertile because you're going towards the Mediterranean coast, but you get into, you go out of the hills into the kind of the foothills, then you get out of the foothills and you're in this broad, wide Mediterranean plain that lands uh, up against the Mediterranean uh, sea. 
So the, the country coming um, from, I'm gonna do it backwards, so, that you, so coming from west to east is flat against the Mediterranean coast, it goes up slightly and then it goes up steeply into the hills and then it descends steeply out of the hills into the desert, down to a desert plain to the Jordan River Valley and then back up into Jordan. So it's incredibly diverse and you're gonna see this in a little while. <clears throat> All right, let me give you modern day uh, uh, um, orientation because that's what's on the map right now. So the nation of Israel, I need to zoom out just a little bit. All right, the modern day nation of Israel goes all the way from Elat, which is down here, the very tip, all the way north to the city of Dan, which is right there at the border of Lebanon and Syria. This region right here, outlined in orange, is a part of Israel today. It's called the Golan Heights. How many of you have heard the term, Golan Heights, okay? This is the region of Golan. The Bible uses the term Bashan, <clears throat> uh, the hills of Bashan. Also, um, Gilead, that's, that's out in here. There is a balm in Gilead. You've heard the terms Gilead. So these Golan Heights ascend out of the region of Galilee, out of the Sea of Galilee, very steeply. They're very fertile. Um, and then up into a plateau that goes out into Syria and Damascus and, uh, and Jordan and then further, uh, further to the east. So these Golan Heights, uh, Israel, uh, uh, Syria lost that in, in a war um, to Israel a couple decades ago. I forget the year, but um, so <clears throat> Golan Heights. And then if you look at this red line right here, and it gets all kind of squirrely right here, and then up around Jerusalem and then back down here to the Dead Sea, this is the West Bank. So um, what does that mean, West Bank? Because you think, as you look at that on a map, you're thinking, but it's east of the shoreline. So it's the West Bank of the Jordan River. Um, so when you hear that on the news, maybe it's better to use the hand for those people that are online. When you hear this on the news, this is how much uh, land is called the, you know, the Palestinian territory. The reason it gets swirly right in here is because this is Jerusalem. Um, and so we'll come back to that in a few minutes. And then all of this region. So the West Bank, uh, there's, there's gates that you pass through as you're traveling to and from in and out of this West Bank area. And there's certain areas of the West Bank that are more hostile or more sensitive than others as you're traveling. And depending on your nationality, there's certain areas that Jews can't go and Palestinians can't leave and things like that. So, and then as you're watching the news today, uh, you would know this area is the Gaza Strip down here, all the way to the southwest corner of the nation. Um, so this is where all the military activity is today. And then the rocket fire, so the, 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 ter the, the terrorist strikes and all that that we heard on the news over the last few months happened all down here in this region. And by the way, this is not a very big piece of land. This is about the size of New Jersey. So when you're looking at this and you're looking at these distances, I mean, to travel from uh, Jerusalem to Hebron is about an hour. Hebron down to Beersheba is about another hour. Um, so you're there. I mean, you're right there by the Gaza Strip, a couple hours outside of Jerusalem. Um, Tel Aviv is up here, down here to Ashkelon, maybe an hour. Uh, you're not far at all. In fact, as you're flying into Tel Aviv and landing at Ben Gurion Airport, you can see the Gaza Strip right off uh, to the left side of the airplane. Uh, it's just, it's all very, very close. Um, so that's, that's why this region is so active right now and, um, and a lot of politics, a lot of history in the dispute. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna zoom out a little bit more. Uh, you know what, let me go back to the biblical narrative. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they spent most of their time on what's called the road of the patriarchs. And that goes along the spine from Beersheba down here up to the hill, to the hill country, Jerusalem, which is where Mount Moriah is. And then up to uh, Bethel, Shiloh, Shechem, which is modern day Nablus, We'll talk about all these locations more in detail. This is Samaria in the New Testament. This is the Northern Kingdom in the Old Testament. 
Um, so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob spent most of their time on this, what's called the road of the patriarchs, on that spinal column, okay, um, of the country. And then we know what happened. They sold Joseph into slavery. A famine came. Uh, so Joseph ends up way over here in the land of Goshen, which is right about where the hand is now. And that's when you come into uh, the end of the book of Genesis. By the end of Genesis, the family of Abraham Isaac and Jacob, the 12 sons, they've all migrated down to Goshen because of a famine. 400 years goes by in the biblical narrative. You turn the page, you open the, the story of Exodus. Now they're enslaved because they outnumbered the Egyptians. And um, they're, gonna, they're gonna begin their exodus. God calls Moses. Moses uh, grew up in Egypt. He then, when he killed the Egyptian, he ended up over here in Midian, which is in northwest uh, Saudi Arabia. This is the land of Midian. He became a shepherd. He, he met a girl, married her, had a family, had a couple boys, spent 40 years there. He was on the backside of the desert over in this area, uh, which hopefully we'll get to look at a little bit later, and um, met God. God said, go back to Egypt, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So before he knows it, he's got about million and a half to two million people following him out of Egypt. And there's, a, there's three primary theories on their route. I'll tell you the one I like the best. Uh, the one I like the best is that they came straight across the Sinai Peninsula down here to what's called Nueva Beach. <clears throat> and they cross at Nueva Beach and then they wander over here to um, the base of, of, to me, one of the best possible locations of Mount Sinai. They camp there for a year, they get the law, they worship the golden calf, uh, they, a lot of people die, um, they get right with God, and they follow God then out of uh, that land. They go north, sorry, going the wrong direction here. They go north up to what's called Kadesh, and there's two possible regions for Kadesh. Some people believe it's over on this side, some people believe it's across this riverbed and over here in what's the, what would be the land of, of uh, Edom and then Moab. So <clears throat> they get here, and you know the story most likely. They send the spies north. This is in the book of Numbers. The spies come back. Twelve men went to spy out Canaan. Ten were bad, and <laughs> some of you remember these kids' songs, okay? Two were good. They decide not to go, they rebel. God says, okay, you're gonna spend the next 38 years wandering. They end up probably in this region, which is the region of Paran, or Paran, and um, 38 years go by. When you get into the end of the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, they are now on a military campaign going north along this eastern slope and they work their way right up to the plains <clears throat> across the, the uh, river from Jericho. So this is where they camped, right here. Um, and the entire book of Deuteronomy, they're located right there. Uh, and they're getting the second law, the, one generation has died, the next generation's grown up, and Moses is giving them the law again, that's why Deuteronomy is repetitive of, of uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and so, they're camped right here on the borders of the Jordan River. Jericho is right here, where the red hand is. So they're out here waiting, and then you enter into the book of Joshua. In Joshua, they, they, they fight Jericho, they work their way up to Ai, and then they, um, they end up up here in, a, in the region called Shiloh. Actually, they go up to Gerizim, Mount Gerizim, and, uh, and they recount the covenant. They end up setting up a capital in Shiloh, 369 years they're in Shiloh, and then uh, you enter into the time of the kings, and the second king, King David, conquers a city that's a Jebusite city, used to be ancient Salem, and they reconquer it, and they set it up as the capital, Jerusalem, and, uh, and then you have the patriarchy. You have, you have David, you have Solomon, and then what happens? The kingdom splits. I'm, t I'm talking about the whole Bible right now, aren't I? Okay, The kingdom splits, okay? So uh, you have a civil split in the kingdom, and basically, at this point, I'm just gonna go back and show you the whole country because um, Judah and Benjamin become, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin become the southern kingdom, and that's basically this region right here, Jerusalem and, and south. 
And then the other uh, 10 tribes occupy all this territory, all the way up to Dan, which is off the screen, and they become the northern kingdom. And so now you've got two kingdoms, and in the Old Testament, one, uh, the southern kingdom is typically referred to as Judah, and the northern kingdom is typically referred to as Israel, uh, or Jacob. And so you, you, know, you bounce back and forth between these two kingdoms, and that means you also have two lines of kings. And it can get confusing reading the Bible at this point because you're, you, you kind of lose your bearings as to which kingdom are you talking about, which line of kings are you talking about, um, and then it gets repetitive because First and Second Kings are repeated in First and Second Chronicles. So, so all of a sudden, you, you know, you really kind of lose your bearings. But you're just really reading about two kingdoms on two trajectories over several hundred years. The Northern Kingdom, all the kings are bad. Uh, they, they, from the very first king Jeroboam, he immediately sets up a pagan altar uh, in Bethel, right there where the hand is, and in Dan, off the screen. Why? Because he doesn't want all of his people going to Jerusalem to worship. He doesn't want them going to the southern kingdom to worship, where they should go to worship God. So he sets up two pagan altars and leads them right into idolatry. And the northern kingdom for hundreds of years is steeped in idolatry. That's the stories of Je Jezebel and Ahab and Jehu and uh, all these stories. Elijah, Elisha, they were prophets to the northern kingdom. And so um, in the 700s, the northern kingdom is wiped, B.C., this northern kingdom is wiped out by the Assyrian army. Uh, the Assyrians come down um, on a couple of campaigns, and they march right down into, uh, into this valley, coming into Galilee, right down all the way to the borders of Jerusalem. They even conquer some cities surrounding Jerusalem. They get right around the walls of Jerusalem. God gives a mighty victory. This is King Hezekiah when he takes his prayer to the temple and prays. God wipes out the armies. Sennacherib wakes up. One day all of his armies are dead. So he goes back home uh, to Nineveh and his sons kill him. But that is the wipe, that's the, that's the destruction of the northern kingdom. Why? Because they were pagan. And God told them for hundreds of years, you're gonna, you're gonna destroy yourselves. And that's exactly what happened. So the southern kingdom is still intact, and they've got good kings and bad kings and good kings and bad kings. It kind of goes on and off. They're the, they're the kingdom that, that has the revivals. Uh, Josiah brought a revival. Hezekiah brought a revival. Um, but then God prophesies through Isaiah and then Jeremiah, hey, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to go into exile. And God, you know the story coming into Daniel, uh, God brings the Babylonians, um, and whether they came across the desert um, I'm not the expert on this, but they came, um, it's likely that they somehow followed some, some sort of fertile journey that would have brought them down or across somehow. But the Babylonians end up invading, King Nebuchadnezzar end up invading, and there's three different deportations. Uh, they completely destroy Jerusalem, uh, much worse than it should have been. Had they cooperated, um, Jerusalem would have remained intact. God didn't want them to be destroyed. He wanted them to be dominated, kind of like the Roman tyranny uh, in Jesus' day. But because they wouldn't cooperate, it ended up getting much bloodier. So a band of exiles go to Babylon. Um, Daniel, Ezekiel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you know all those names. They end up um, over in, uh, in, in Babylon and... Um, 70 years go by, God sends the people back. Three, three groups come back. Um, the first group is commissioned to rebuild the temple, which stutters and stops and starts again. And then the second uh, group with Nehemiah rebuilds the walls. So you've got Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and so by the time you've got all the returns back in this land, the walls are rebuilt, the temple's rebuilt, and you've got about 400 years of this nation now kind of floundering as a fledgling, reconstituted, but you know, on and off with God, and it's just, just kind of this nondescript 400 years. And at the end of that 400 years, you turn the page to Matthew chapter one, and Jesus shows up. So um, what I wanna do for the next 30 minutes or so is talk to you geographically about the life of Jesus and press in a little more to the land itself. Oops, that's not what I wanna do. Um, and what, what we're gonna do is talk, we're gonna just track the life of Jesus, and I'm gonna zoom into the site, show it to you on Google Earth, and then I'm gonna show you the pictures that I have of that site. Sound good? Okay, all right. 
Um, so help me out, where did Jesus begin his earthly existence? Trick question. Did, did his earthly existence begin in Bethlehem? Mm, I told you it was a trick question. Where did we first hear about the birth of Jesus? Not Bethlehem. That's nine months after we first hear about the birth of Jesus. Nazareth. The angel comes to Mary, right? Life begins at conception. The Holy Ghost comes upon her. So Mary and Joseph live in Nazareth. Nazareth is in Galilee. So I'm just going to stick with the hand. Right there, right at, the, right at the top of the pointer finger is Nazareth. So that's where we're going to start our journey today, all right? So I'm going to zoom into Nazareth. I'm going to show you the 2D version of Nazareth first. And then I'm going to... Um, I'm gonna make it 3D. Let me just give you a little bit of your bearings here. So you have the deep valley of the Jordan Rift coming between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. You have the mountain, the hill country, which is right here. But right up here in Janine, the hill country kind of peters out into a valley. And it, it also kind of dog legs left. And you can see uh, to the west, these hills continue up all the way to this point, which is modern day Haifa. This ridge, this range really, is called Mount Carmel. Now we think, in modern terms, we think of a mountain as one peak, but biblically a mountain was usually a range. And Carmel is really all of this range from here all the way up to the, to the peak. The very peak of Carmel, where we believe Elijah met the prophets of, of Baal or Baal, is right about where this hand is. But it's a, it's a long ridge. The reason I'm showing you this is that, I'm gonna show you pictures in a minute, looking from these hills north, this is a huge valley that I'm encircling right now. It's a giant valley, and it's got two names in scripture. Anybody remember the names of the most popular valley in scripture? Megiddo. The Valley of Megiddo. What word does that remind you of? Armageddon. Armageddon. Okay, so we read in Revelation of a giant battle in this location of Megiddo, okay? Armageddon is the pushing together of two words, har, which means hill, Megiddo, which is the name of this valley. So the hill of Megiddo. And there's two thoughts for what the hill of Megiddo is. There's actually a city uh, an ancient city, a Canaanite city, right over in here called Megiddo that goes back to, to before the time of Joshua. Um, so this entire valley is called Megiddo. The second name for this in scripture is Jezreel. Now, that's another thing about the Bible is there's, over centuries, the names change, and so sometimes, like, you're talking about Mount Sinai, and... Um, Horeb, you hear, you read a word, the word Horeb. They're the same mountain, uh, but it's called different things, you know. So um, a lot of times you're dealing with the same places, but the names have changed. So the Northern Kingdom or Samaria or Shechem, that's the same region. But just generation to generation, they were called different things. So Jezreel, the Valley of Jezreel, is the same as the Valley of Megiddo. Um, Jezreel was a city. It's where one of the palaces of King Ahab was. And that's the story of Naboth's vineyard and Ahab wanting the vineyard and Jezebel telling him, just take it. You guys remember that story? Um, so that, that's a northern kingdom story. And that Jezreel, the city of Jezreel is over here where the hand is. And, and um, so this is a giant valley. It's the breadbasket uh, of Israel. If you've been to California, this is like the San Joaquin Valley uh, in California. It's just vast, it's all farmland, um, and it's surrounded by hills on both sides. So directly across where these hills empty out of this valley, across the wide valley, way up into these hills is the village of Nazareth. So I just want you to understand that this is all flat land in here but over here, it, it rises steeply up into the hills. And then all of this, 
would be called the, the Galilean hillsides. Or the, and you read in the Gospels of Jesus preaching in all the villages of Galilee, it's all of this hill country to the north. Lots of valleys, lots of ravines, lots of rolling hills. It's very, very beautiful. So I'm gonna go back down here and find Nazareth again. Lost my place. Okay, here's Nazareth right here. So I'm gonna try to um, tilt this, and I hope I don't make you sick. Let me just see if this is gonna work. Uh, isn't that cool? That is really cool. Whoa, too much. Okay. So you can kind of see the hills descending down to the Jordan Valley. This, this, this is the Valley of Jezreel that comes up, kind of hooks around this uh, peak of, of Gilboa, and then all the way up towards the coastline. So we're gonna zoom in. This is interesting. Um, Mount, the hill of Moray, you'll read in scripture, it's right here. Um, this is Mount Tabor, right here where the hand is. And then we're gonna zoom in to Nazareth is gonna be, come on, where are you now? Oh, there you are, okay, here we go, here's Nazareth. Are we okay, am I making you guys sick? Okay, good, all right, not yet, okay. I'll, I'll try to move a little faster. Uh, <laughs> make you dizzy, okay. So Nazareth, I don't, you, it's really hard to get a sense for how steep these hills are, but they're very steep. And, and Nazareth is built up into, this, into these hills right here. There's a, there's a location right here called Mount Precipice that overlooks the entire uh, valley of Jezreel and Megiddo. And I'll show you that in a minute, okay? So I'm gonna go zoom in a little closer to the village of Nazareth. It's, it's a big city right now, but when Jesus was born, it was maybe a couple hundred people. It was just a small Rural, backwater, out of the way. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Uh, Galilee was the, was, 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 forgive me, it was West Virginia. It was the hills of West Virginia. You know, if you're in West Virginia, I love you. And I love West Virginia. But you know, it was just out of the way, okay? Um, and there is a location here, and, and the, the, the Catholic Church has taken basically every traditional site and built a church on it. And so the Church of the Annunciation, under that site, they've got some excavations. They believe that's actually the home of Mary. Um, whether it is or not is, uh, you know, is anybody's guess. But a couple hundred yards away, there's a piece of land right here that was undeveloped. And today it's called Nazareth Village. Um, a friend of mine, Amr, is, has been one of our tour guides on a number of occasions. He and some businessmen from this hospital right up here this was actually owned, this land was owned by the hospital that's up on the hill above it. They decided to take that piece of land that was undeveloped and turn it into a first century experience for tourists that came through. And as they began to set this up and excavate, guess what they found? They found a first century Nazareth village. <laughs> like, it, like, they found it. And the thing that's cool about this is it's a couple hundred yards walk from where they believe Mary lived and this site in Nazareth Village that I'm gonna show you pictures of fits perfectly the descriptions of some of the parables of Jesus. When he talks about the man that had a vineyard and put a wall around it and built a tower, and then he talks about the parable of the sower and the seed and the soil and the rocky and the path and the good ground, it's all right there. And that is so cool to see this. And, and so they found, they found the tower, they found the wall, they found the vineyard, they found the, uh, the wine press, they found all this that dates back to first century and uh, they began to excavate it and so it's, it's just a precious thing. All right, so with that, let me um, go to some pictures here and pull up Nazareth. So that is modern day Nazareth. And now we're at the precipice looking north. 
So I, I want to give you your bearings here. All right, so the photo I'm going to show you is standing right here on a peak looking north out into this valley. And that's a view on a cloudy day. That's looking now to the east and Mount Tabor. This is Mount Tabor in the distance. A little bit closer up to Mount Tabor. That's looking now more south. And this is the Hill of Moray. And right here is the village of Nain. Jesus is gonna visit there and raise a widow's son from the dead. Also, it's um, Endor, where Saul found the witch that he tried to get in touch with the underworld or the afterlife. Uh, so this is still looking from the same vantage point up on this precipice. You can just see the terrain, the rocks, the dry brush. Okay, I've been there six different times and at different times of the year. So you saw how dry everything was in the fall. This is in March. There's about two week, two, I'm sorry, about two months of the year that everything that's normally very brown just greens right up and it becomes very beautiful. Um, there's always a part of the country that's green. And so Psalm 23, when um, David said, he leads me, he makes me to lie down in what? green pastures. What's the, what's the cultural, contextual significance of that? In that? That is that the pastures were always going brown. They were always dying out seasonally. And so a good shepherd always knows where to take the sheep next to find the next green pasture. So I love that. We were driving south one day, and I, I, I'm, I'm sitting in the bus with our tour guide, Avi, and I said, Avi, because I'm, I'm noticing the brown and it would go south and get into the hill country, it's greener, and I'm seeing shepherds and sheep, and it's like the light bulb comes on. And I said, Avi, these guys migrate these sheep from dying pastures to, to green pastures, season to season. He goes, he laughed, he laughed at me like I'm an idiot, you know? And I said, I'm sorry, I didn't grow up in Israel, and I'm not a shepherd in that sense of the word. So, um, but it just, it blessed me to think, God knows how to get me to my next provision. God knows how to pay my next bills. God knows how to cultivate and lead my soul forward. He's gonna provide for me. And he wants me to rest. The place I can be at most rest is following him. And as long as I'm following him, all of my needs will be met. Uh, all of, he will take care of me. And so he is the good shepherd. I love that. So I love that view um, because it just shows you the, 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 the difference in the... Uh, in the scenery. All right, let's go back to Nazareth here. So this is now looking at the center of what would have been the village of Nazareth. The Church of the Annunciation, Mary's home, would have been right about here. And then Nazareth Village is just to the left of this arrow off the screen. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit now to Nazareth Village. And I'm gonna get a little bit closer up. And when they built this village, they went back to first century customs and they did it absolutely to spec. So the cloth of the costume, they hire people. It's kind of like Sturbridge Village or kind of like, uh, you know, what's the one in Virginia? Williamsburg, p p period people in costumes and cooking the way they cooked. And, and so they've got, they've got people cooking, people weaving, people doing carpentry, people doing uh, shepherds and people farming and a, a, a wine press, an olive press. It's all active, it's all working. So the experience is you're walking literally through first century reality. So here's a, a lady making bread, wood, wood fire in an oven, very much like they would have had. So these are the paths that, that went through this hillside. And one thing you need to know about this is you can't see this from the picture, but this is built into a very steep slope. This whole village was built into a slope. So all the hillsides are terraced. So you can see the stone walls and then the flat path, and then it goes down again and there's a terrace. So this is the, the wine press that they discovered on the site, which runs down, so they would step on and crush the grapes here and the wine would run down this channel into a vat uh, where they would catch it. Um, this is more of the same site, it was a farm, it was a first century farm is what they excavated. So you can see the olive trees 
Um, you can see the paths. So here's another shot of, again, the terrace with a working farm, the walls. So this is what I mean when when we're talking about the parable of the soil and the seed and the sower. Uh, I mean, in this one shot, you can see good soil, you can see stony ground, you can see the path, you can see the thorns that would choke out the seeds. You can see it all in one shot. Here's another one with the same thing. You can see the same, the good soil, the the, the path, the stony ground, stony ground up in here, the, the thorns that are gonna choke it out. So the reason I love these photos is this, was the boyhood of Jesus, right? This is not just where his parents grew up, this is where he grew up um, and living this life. So his stories came out of, to some degree, his childhood experiences. This is um, an olive press, the beginnings of an olive press. And what they would do is crush the olives, and uh, I'm not the, the expert on the process, but then they would put the oil into these baskets and then they would put the baskets under these weights and they would press them three times to get the oil out. And the first press was the best oil, the second press was mid-grade, the last press was cheap oil, and they had different purposes for those oils. Um, And there's some biblical significance to that, but I won't take the time to go through that because I didn't study that this week. Um, So here's a a potter, Uh, this is a carpenter doing some woodworking. These are residents of Nazareth, by the way, which is interesting. Um, they, they live in this, uh, in this village. This is a lady that's taking wool and weaving it into threads and fabric, and, and they you know, go through the whole process and show you and, and how they dye the, the wools and come up with the different colors. This is the inside of a synagogue, and it's built to scale. It's built to spec. It's exactly what first century Galilean synagogues would have been like. So Jesus would have spent his boyhood going into these places to teach or to to be taught. Um, And then we're gonna come later in his life to when he comes to Nazareth to teach and gets rejected. And he would have been sitting in a space, standing in a space just like that, the exterior of the synagogue. So uh, so that's, that's Nazareth, okay? Am I going too fast? Everybody okay? All right. Um, So, The angel tells Mary, hey, you're gonna have a baby. And then nine months later, there went out a decree into all the world, that all all the world should be taxed, right? And so now we're at Luke one and two. And so Mary and Joseph have to make a journey. They have to go to the city of David. Now that term city of David refers to two places. In the first place, it it refers to Bethlehem. We'll come later to what it refers to in the second place. And I'm gonna take a break in a few minutes here, just in case you're wondering. So Mary and Joseph, they, they come out of Nazareth and they would have done this dozens of times in Jesus' lifetime. Because three times a year, the Hebrew males were called to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts, three big feast seasons. I love this principle. Three breaks. Take a break from your work, set aside everything, It would have taken them five days to journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem by foot. So it would have been five days to get to Jerusalem, anticipating the whole time the arrival. And the last day would have been going uphill out of Jericho up into Jerusalem, and they would have sung what's called in Psalms the Psalms of Ascent. And um, you read those Psalms, think of the pilgrims going up into Jerusalem to celebrate their feast. They would have gotten into town, and uh, gone to the pool of Siloam to purify themselves, and then they would have walked in Jerusalem in like a massive homecoming celebration. They would have had to first offer offerings and atonement for their sins and worship to the Lord. But then the rest of the week was a feast, and it was a festival. It was, it was just a, a, a national celebration. So think of Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Fourth of July. You know, what we do as a nation kind of finds its roots in the heart of God saying three times a year, I want you to take not just a week for feasting, but I want you to take a week or more on the front end and the back end and travel. So you think about that for Jesus and his family, nine weeks a year, they're either on their way to Jerusalem, at Jerusalem or coming back. And the journey they would have taken would have brought them out of the hill country, down across this valley, 
um, to Gideon's spring, which I'll show you later, and then up to another spring right down here, which is the spring of Jezreel. They would have kind of re replenished their water supplies. They would have been staying along the way, you know, five days journey. Then they would journey down this Jordan River Valley along uh, the hillside. They would have come all the way down to Jericho. This is a 90 mile journey. When they get to Jericho, they're gonna turn right and they're gonna go up into these hills through what's called a wadi. A wadi is a canyon. It's a, it's a dry riverbed that winds its way up through um, these, this, this twisting valley and it opens out into Jerusalem. It is, the, it is the road that Jesus and his listeners had in mind when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, and I'll show you pictures of that road later. So they come up into Jerusalem to the temple, which we'll come back to later. But Mary and Joseph on this occasion, they're gonna journey past Jerusalem to Bethlehem. So even more than 90 miles. Bethlehem is about four miles south of Jerusalem. And in modern day, it's really just been swallowed up by Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's like saying Brooklyn is a part of New York City or uh, you know, Staten Island is a part, you know, it's just, it's, it's a part of the metropolitan area of Jerusalem. Bethlehem at the time was a small village in the hills. It's very populated now and very settled. So I'm gonna go to my photos. We're gonna leave Nazareth. Let's go back to Bethlehem now. So the hills of Bethlehem, Bethlehem's in the West Bank. And so about three of the trips I went on, they said we can't go there today. Um, they, they monitor hostilities and tensions, and especially for the Jewish guides. If you have a Jewish guide, you don't go into some of these areas. The, even though we as Americans or Christians could probably go into these areas, um, we don't go if our guide, sometimes we dropped our guide off at a mall and then we just kept going into Bethlehem. But this is looking from what's called, what's called um, well this is actually the hillside of Bethlehem. And you can see the rock area in front of me where I'm standing, um, looking out on what's called the shepherd's fields. So again, two months a year, these fields are very green. But even as I'm standing there in this picture, there's flocks down at the base in this valley. I'm just gonna zip through these a little bit. You can see how built up it is. Um, very modern, a lot of apartments. And some of these lines, it's kind of weird, like this is a Jewish, this is Israel and where I'm standing is West Bank. And you can almost throw a rock and, and hit it, you know. So the, the lines and the borders are, it's really confusing when you're there actually. So all I'm doing right now, I took a picture looking one direction, that's kind of south, I'm sorry, looking north, and I'm gonna turn around and show you the site that I'm standing on. And this site is a first century um, home, domicile, but it's a place where they kept animals as well, and I'll show you that as we go through this. It's now a kind of a touristy place where you go with groups and you can sing Christmas carols and things like that. So I zoomed in my camera and there you go, there's shepherds, I was looking hard for angels, but I didn't see any. <laughs> so this is a different season of the year, you can see because of the greenery. And again, these are all, these ruins all go back to first century. You can see also in the distance the terraces on the hillside. I've never seen a land so, ter I mean from north to south and east to west, every mountain is terraced. It's unbelievable. You can see thousands and thousands of years of people turning these hills into farms and, and, and making this land fertile. Um, so this is the inside. So um, under where I'm standing, I'm gonna go back to, built into all this rock area are some caves that have been dug out. And so this picture is inside one of those caves. This is a stable. We think of a stable as, you know, clapboard and a you know, barn door. These stables were built in and dug into the rock and kind of underground. And you can see the entrances to some of them on some of these photographs. So when Jesus said, I'm the door to the sheepfold, this is the image they would have had. 
There's only one way into these places and one way out, um, and they're very enclosed and protected. This is the sheepfold, going down into it, and um, one way in, and the shepherd typically would somehow sleep at this entrance uh, so that nothing could get in to harm the sheep. And this is, again, the inside. And honestly, for all we know, this could be the place. I mean, nobody really knows. You know, it's, it's like maybe, maybe not, could be, but at least it's like this. That, that's kind of the idea, is uh, the place where Jesus was born would have been similar to this, this space. Pretty cool, isn't it? Not what you, it doesn't look like your manger setting at home, does it? You gotta rethink it now, don't you? <laughs> Sweetheart, we gotta go to Michael's and get some paper mache materials. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to build a new manger scene, you know? Um, so that is uh, really all I have to show you of, of Bethlehem. It's honestly, to go there today, it's, there's not much to see. Um, it's mostly built up. Um, it's, it's underdeveloped in terms of the, the quality of life. Uh, there's a couple of shops that want to sell you olive wood um, nativity scenes. Uh, so you kind of go, it's like a one stop, you, you do your quick sight there and you're gone. All right, so we did Bethlehem, we did Nazareth. Jesus is born in Nazareth. We know that then he goes, um, I'm going to zoom out, we're about to take a break, so let me just zoom out very quickly and get our bearings again. we're going to take a restroom break. All right. So Jesus grows up in Nazareth. and I'm sorry, his childhood, he goes to Egypt, right, for a few years. Then they come back to Nazareth, and 30 years go by. He's 12. He goes to the temple. He teaches. He gets law. His parents lose him. They find him. Um, he goes back to Nazareth, and we're going to pick it up here in Nazareth with Jesus' adulthood, and we're gonna start his ministry in the next hour. So what I'd like to do, it is, on my clock, it's 9.56, I'd like to start back, I'd like to do eight minute break, I'd like to start back at 10.04, okay? 10.04, on your mark, get set, go. If you're online, eight minutes, we'll start back up.
sight for all to see. Promise unbroken. Okay, come on back down to your place, and I am going to hand this stuff out, so if you're waiting, you don't even have to wait, um, or you can grab it, that's fine too. If I could have a couple of our uh, staff guys come up and help me to hand these out, that would be great. All right, come on back down. We got to get started. You guys are taking my talk time.
Okay, if we could uh, have some help pulling the back doors closed, maybe Ashley or a couple of others, if you could pull those doors closed. The staff guys are handing out three documents to you right now. We will reference those in, in a moment, and I wanted you to be able to take those with you. Shout out to those of uh, joining online. Welcome, wherever you're coming from. We're glad that you're joining us. Somebody messaged me this morning and they said, we'll be watching from the UK. I'm like, okay. Made me hungry for fish and chips when they said that. Okay, does everybody have the maps? Raise your hand if we missed you. Okay, Stephen right here in the middle and then one or two up front. Okay, are you ready? Anybody else need maps? Few hands still up, few hands. All right, so do me a favor. Set those down to somewhere to the side. We're gonna pull them up in just a few minutes. Um, and, and, and then you can take them and reference them for the future or frame it and use it as a keepsake or something. This was, you, could, you could tell everybody, yeah, this is when I went to Israel. Okay, so remember the, the big narrative of scripture and it's, For a lot of years, I thought it was more confusing than it really is. Um, And when you think about what I just talked you through, Genesis is creation, Exodus is the, the family of Abraham multiplied, coming out of Egypt into the promised land. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is all that, organization, journeying, getting to the borders. Joshua, they conquered the land. Judges, real bad period of time, everything goes badly, but then you get into the period of the kings, several hundred years of kings, and then you move into exile. Northern kingdoms destroyed, Babylon, 70 years later they come back, 400 years of silence and kind of in between, and then New Testament, Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the life of Christ, the book of Acts, Jesus has resurrected, ascended, the church spreads across the world, and then the rest of the New Testament is basically instructions to churches, and Revelation is how it all comes to a conclusion. So the, the, the narrative of Scripture is really not that complicated. Um, but the Bible's not put together in just a straight line. You know, it's not a straight narrative line. There's, there's, there's a lot of layers to it. So all the section of the prophets overlays the, the nation of, of Israel's history. You have prophets to the northern kingdom, prophets to the southern kingdom, prophets to other places like Jonah going to Nineveh. You have Psalms, the longest book in the Bible. What is that? That's just what they were feeling and experiencing in their hearts as as this history was unfolding and in their personal relationship with Christ, with with God. And um, so the narrative where we're at now, we're starting into the gospels and life of Christ. And for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll just talk about the timeline of Jesus' life. 
now that he's an adult. I think now that you've seen some of Nazareth, the first thing I want to do is show you um, another location near Nazareth that really was, was, one, was amazing. Again, big picture, let me give you your bearings here too. In the nation of Israel, you have Galilee up to the north and the Sea of Galilee. And then you have this middle section of the country, which in Jesus' day was called Samaria. And then you have the southern part of the country, which in Jesus' day was called Judah or Judea. So we went from Galilee into Judea. What's he doing? He's going south. Judea is the hill country all around Jerusalem. Um, so here is the Red Sea, which is the Jordan River runs down into the, I'm sorry, the Dead Sea. Galilee, Dead Sea, Red Sea, okay? Just to give you your bearings there. All right, so let's zoom in back to Nazareth where Jesus is growing up. If you guys are enjoying this half as much as I am, we're in good shape, because I am, I just love this. Yes, it does make me ready to go again, for sure. Um, okay, so this is interesting. You can see on this map at this point, the, the, the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee, which quickly ascends up into these hills, and then winding through these hills, you have the village of Cana, which we're gonna come to. You have uh, just a short walk away, half a day maybe, you've got Nazareth. And then right outside of this area, um, you have a Roman city called Sepphoris. And I think it's what's called here is Zippori. The reason I wanna show you this is this was not a long walk out of Nazareth out of the village of Nazareth, down through these hills to this Roman city. And it's built up on, uh, in the hills overlooking this valley to um, the north. The reason this is important, ah, there's so much to say. Uh, let me zoom back out and give you a sense of this. This northern shore of the Sea of Galilee is a major, huge intersection for global trade. So all of the commerce coming out of Asia, which is modern day Turkey, to the east or the west, Fertile Crescent um, and regions west, comes, comes down into, it, there's only two ways, and that would have been the way of the sea, which is called Via Maris, which, was, which would have been along the, the Mediterranean coast, or down this, this valley of what's called Upper Galilee. So two major highways, two major arteries that get to Arabia and Africa. And the thing that's really cool about it, Isaiah said, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. How many of you have heard that verse preached on at Christmas time? Okay, well in that same passage, he talks about what people he's talking about. And he uses the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those are tribes of Israel, and the allotment of those tribes, the land given to those tribes, was Nazareth and Galilee. So what, he say, what Isaiah is saying is the people of this Galilean region, there's going to be a massive explosion of light that once they were in darkness, once they were oppressed, and this is the region the Assyrians overran, the destruction of the Northern Kingdom. So nobody would have ever imagined anything great happening here. That's why the disciples were like, can anything good come out of Nazareth, okay? This was, a, this, at this point, at Jesus' day, this was a mixture of a lot of Gentile people lived in this region as well as Jewish people. It was called Galilee of the Gentiles because of this massive trade that was coming in the region. So there were Roman cities, Gentile cities, and there were Jewish villages, and it was this mix. And then on the, um, on the eastern slope of the lake was, was all Gentile. It's called Decapolis or Gadara, uh, 10 Roman cities that were out in that region. So the, the reason I'm pointing this out is that there's a major road in Jesus' day, a highway, not like we think of a highway with McDonald's and gas stations and paving, but you know what I'm talking about, a major route that at this juncture of the North Shore would turn left 
And right here in, in Magdala, Mary of Magdalene, in her village, you could, uh, you could hook, well, it would be right if you're coming south, another right, and come down through this vast valley into the valley of Jezreel, and then there was another cut through where you could get out to the coast and then down to Egypt and Africa. So a major trade route. So the Romans set up a city in Jesus' day um, just north of Nazareth called uh, Sepphoris. I want to say Sephora, but that's the cosmetic store. (laughs) Sepphoris, okay? Sepphoris is right here. It's an amazing Roman ruin, and I'm going to show you pictures of it. The reason it's significant, this just gives me chills. Um, I'm getting out of order here, so I have to go and find it. Come on, I know it's on here. There it is, okay. Sepphoris looks like this. So you can see the hills in the distance. This, this, all this country is beautiful and hilly, but you can see these stones, and you can see the ruins of homes and markets. Through that, throughout this ruin, um, you can see this mosaic floor. Was, this was a house or a shop along this main uh, road. Houses on both sides. So the word carpenter means more of a stone worker than a woodworker, but both. But in this time, it would have been more about stone, working with stones. So we know that Joseph was a carpenter, so Jesus grew up working with his dad and his brothers. What did he do? Well, this was all done in the first 30 years of the first century. And it's a couple hours from Nazareth. So, Most of the guides and scholars believe this is where Jesus spent his young adult life working. So you're standing there and and your guide says, you know, for all we know, Jesus laid these stones (laughs) or built this house before he started his earthly ministry. Um, And it's an amazing site with, all this was buried and it's all been excavated. You can see the mosaics. These were homes. So I show you that because this is, I mean, we're all but sure that Jesus and his brothers and his dad made their living helping to build this Roman city. All right, so that is, uh, that's up in that region. So now we're gonna zoom back out and we're gonna talk about the life of Jesus. Other than his incident at the temple when he's 12, the very first thing we know about Jesus in his adult life is his baptism. And so John the Baptist, his cousin, has been sent as a forerunner, kind of the PR guy, spiritually speaking, to get the nation ready for the arrival of the Messiah. So John the Baptist is a megaphone saying, make your heart ready, come back to God, repent, um, because the kingdom of God is, is, is here, it's about to happen. And so thousands of people come to John out of Jerusalem, which is here, to Jordan, which is down here by Jericho, to this part of the Jordan. This region is called Bethabara or Bethabara, however you want to say it. And Jesus spends a lot of time here at the beginning and at the end of his ministry. So we're going to zoom in to, there's, there's two baptism sites when you're on a tour. Uh, one is up north by, the, by Galilee. This one is the one that's more true to biblical history. Now let me tell you what's important about this site. It goes all the way back to Joshua. This was the site of the crossing of the Jordan River to go conquer the Promised Land. So the children of Israel were camped on this side. They cross, and the river had much, you can even see a little bit of the, of the shape of the land. The river had much wider flow than the pictures you're gonna see. It's just a little stream at this point um, today. But the Israelites crossed here and, uh, and then Gilgal that you read about in the book of Joshua where they kind of, it was kind of like their place of celebration once they got into the promised land, major victory as a nation. It's somewhere in these plains across the Jordan River. But you can see Jericho is off to the left. Um, and it's a big modern city today in the West Bank, but there, are, there is a, a mound of ruins of ancient Jericho still there today. So this site, Jesus goes down to this site in his adulthood 
You can see how rugged this land is. Let's tilt it. It's just barren, sorry. So let's move, move in a little bit. Isn't this cool? Yes. That's the Jordan River, that snaky little stream. Uh, and it's just a dirty, muddy little thing. I mean, we went to that baptism site, and I'm like, who wants to be baptized in this? I guess you could call me Naaman. Because um, he complained about being baptized in the Jordan River or dunking in the Jordan River. So you can see this surround, so this is Jordan, modern day Jordan on this side, and this is Israel on this side. And this site right here is called the Fabra. So it looks like this. So the river, where I'm standing here, the river's behind me, and I'm looking west. So I'm looking towards the hills that lead up into Jerusalem and into southern Israel. Um, and this site has been decorated in nice plants and gravel and stuff like that. Now I'm turned exactly around looking into Jordan. So these buildings are actually the country of Jordan. The, the river is the border. But these hills uh, and just beyond would have been where the Israelites were camped. And the river is down here in the, in the, we, in the weeds, which I'm gonna show you now. So that's the baptismal site for the river. And uh, it's, it's really cool to be baptized there because that is the location most likely or somewhere close to it where Jesus was baptized and where John was preaching. So Jesus comes to John, you remember the story, John doesn't um, wanna baptize him, he's I'm not worthy to baptize you, and Jesus said this is the way it needs to be. And, uh, and Jesus is baptized and the Spirit of God descends and the voice of God. I marvel how many times God said from heaven, this is my son, listen to him, it's amazing to me. Um, for us, it's all faith. I mean, God validates himself to us in, in, in tangible ways, but I mean, I've never heard a voice from heaven saying, Jesus is the truth, follow him. You know, and that's what they experienced. It's amazing to me that so many of them were so hard and so resistant, uh, even though they heard that. This is just a, a, a wider shot of the same, looks like a mud hole, doesn't it? Uh, the same spot. So that's, that's the Fabra. Okay, so Jesus goes from Bethabara. Anybody know what he did next, right after he got baptized? The wilderness, to be what? To be tempted, okay. So he goes uh, a little bit to the west and probably south into the Negev Desert and to the wilderness. So we're gonna go there next. Let's look at the map first. So if we pull out a little bit. And you're just gonna see how barren this land is. So this is Jericho up in here. And we're just gonna keep moving south along these hills. This is the Dead Sea. And this is the Judean wilderness as we go further south. Okay. As you go all the way down to the very southern tip, which I don't, I don't know that he went that far, but as you go to the southern tip of the Dead Sea, you come to Masada. Uh, en Gedi is right here. I'll show you pictures of En Gedi in a few minutes. That's where David hid from Saul in the cave. The one thing about these sites is they're so layered with biblical history. And at every site, you almost have to go, okay, early Old Testament, middle Old Testament, late Old Testament, New Testament, later New Testament. You know, you have to, you have to play out all the scenes of the Bible because, you know, David's hiding in Getty in one generation and then Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, the same basic wilderness, in another generation. Um, so the stories layer on top of all these sites in so many ways. Um, but Masada is down here, just past in Getty a little bit. Uh, There it is, right, right down here. Okay, so the Judean wilderness is what I wanna show you pictures of now, and then we will zoom into some of these sites. Let me come back to my photos. All right, we're just gonna go through one shot at a time. In no particular order, these pictures, the first ones were, picked, were taken at the caves of Qumran. Anybody ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, so these were found 
and I want to say in the 50s, I'd have to Google this, but um, a Bedouin shepherd kid was up in these rocks and threw a stone into a cave and heard something shatter and went and looked and it was a, it was a clay vessel and there were all these Old Testament scrolls that date way, they were the oldest scrolls that are on record. It's really sad what happened to them because they changed hands a number of times and they got bought out by people that fragmented them and sold them out for fragments and, and so now you know, there's been a more recent effort to collect them and rejoin them and, and see the value in them. But you can see in these rocks, in some of these photos, caves, and you'll, you'll see that as we keep going. This is everywhere in Israel. And I wanted to show you this. This is in the wilderness, but it's also in Jerusalem and it's also in Galilee. Everywhere you go, you touch the wrong tree the wrong way and you're gonna have some blood on your hands um, because those thorns are, they're, 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 they're small, but they're like firm. And uh, they're really, really sharp. And so it wouldn't have been hard to make a crown of thorns. Uh, those are everywhere. Um, Okay, so this is in Getty, and you can see the caves up on the cliff. Um, again, just rugged, rugged terrain and wilderness. This is the, uh, I think this is the first spring. There's two springs you come to when you're hiking in Getty. Um, in fact, let me just go back to the map for a minute to show you in Getty on the map. So you're driving along down this wilderness or walking if you're David or Jesus and you come to a little bit of an oasis and a, a wadi or a ravine that comes out of the hills um, and kind of a reserve here. Well, I don't need to do that. Yeah, right here. So this is the trail that goes up to the cave where David hid. And I'm just showing you this view of it because I'm getting ready to show you some more pictures of it. You, you, you park and you, it's a short hike back to a lower waterfall right here. And then it's a very steep hike back to a larger cave right here with a huge waterfall um, that, that finds its way down into the Dead Sea. So this is that lower waterfall. <clears throat> this is um, taking that hike up above the lower waterfall, turning around, looking back out over the wilderness and over the Dead Sea. This also would be the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah um, that go all the way up in that Jordan River Valley towards Galilee. Same thing, just looking at this. I think this is back at Qumran. But it starts to all look the same after a while. More, more shots of Qumran. Uh, this is back at En Gedi. Okay, see the mountain in the very far distance? Those are the range of Pisgah, and Mount Nebo is the peak of that range, and that's where Moses died. So I showed you how the children of Israel came up the east side of, of, of the Jordan Valley. That's these hills right over here, um, across from Israel. Okay. Let's go to the next one. This is from Masada. So just getting the panoramic view, looking back north towards En Gedi. Jerusalem would be far north up in these hills. Um, and we're up on this plateau now. Uh, this is looking down from Masada. The significance of this photograph, you can see the rock formation right here that's square. Do you guys see that? This is the um, Roman encampment from the siege on Masada after the destruction of Jerusalem. That's not a biblical story, but it's, it's, it's after the Bible accounts. It's the holdouts trying to fight off the Roman army. And they, it's kind of their, Masada is kind of Israel's Gettysburg. Um, it's, a, it's a patriotic place where the last Jewish resistors died. Um, and it's a very sad story when you, when you look it up and read it. But that's one of the Roman camps that's a, that's a closer up shot of the Roman camp. More shots of the wilderness, looking north along the west shore of the Dead Sea. You can see how the sea is receding as well. Um, 
This is the top of Masada, just showing you the ruins. This was, a, in Jesus' day, this was a, one of Herod's palaces. Herod the Great built a desert oasis palace in the southern part of the desert, and it was very ornate. This was the ramp that the Romans built in first century to uh, get into the palace to kill those final holdout Jews. They knew they were gonna die, so they, they all, um, they drew lots, they all committed suicide, and the one that drew the, the, the last lot was the last guy to live, and he, so he had to kill himself at the end. This is a very sad story. Um, this is from Masada looking out again towards the Dead Sea. Top of Masada. These are some of the ruins of Herod's palace up there. You can see some of the, um, the, the artistry on the walls. So these stone walls would have all been covered with this plaster. So when you see the ruins and you see it's just stones, they covered the walls, kind of like we do with sheetrock. This is, this is early versions of sheetrock. And some of you live in homes that still have plaster walls, so you wouldn't know what that's all about. Um, again, shots from Masada. This is looking south um, west. And that's my best friend. Uh, so this, the reason I put this photo in here is not so you could see me and Dana. I wanted you to see the larger waterfall, and it, it's deceptive. It's much bigger than it looks like in this photo. You can see the people standing right under it. It's very tall. What I want you to see is this rock face right here with stalag, either mites or tights. I forget which ones grow up and which ones grow down. Anybody know? Tights, okay. Amy says tights, I'm going with tights, uh, stalactites. Here's the interesting thing. When you get there and you see this cave and you're trying to imagine David with his, I forget how many men, 300 men or something like that, hiding from Saul, and it's a narrow ravine and Saul with his men coming up into this ravine, you're trying to imagine where's the cave? It's not there anymore, um, but because this was a roof that extended out over where I'm even standing in the photograph, and the way we know that is that these stalactites don't grow the way it is now. And there's all kinds of collapsed rock in this area, so in some uh, seismic event, that roof collapsed. But if, if, at one point, it was a massive cave. I'm talking about the size of like a gymnasium. And the thing that I've always wondered all my life, how did David and 300 men hide from Saul? Saul goes in that cave to take a leak, excuse me, but that's what he was doing. <laughs> And not, not a single, he doesn't hear 300 guys. Surely one of them is gonna cough or sneeze. How do you not hear all that breathing? That waterfall is, is natural white noise. And if you've ever put on white noise, you can't hear anything. David and his men could have been in the back of that cave talking at full volume and Saul would have never known they were there because of the noise of that waterfall. It's amazing um, just, just to, to stand there and see it. And uh, it's so fun to take Dana there. So you can see the formation of, the, of what would have been the roof of the cave that would have extended out. That's the water, same waterfall. So this is hiking in and hiking out. This gives you an idea of the narrowness of the ravine and why it was a good hiding place for David. You say, wait a minute, we're, aren't we doing the life of Jesus? We're in the wilderness. And so I gotta tell you about all the stuff that's happening in the wilderness, right? Um, and that's the Dead Sea, and that is the mountains of Jordan and, and ancient uh, Edom and Moab. Okay, that's so cool. I love these rams. So these are ibexes, and my first two trips, we didn't even see one, and then my last two trips, we saw hundreds and hundreds. I mean, just like a herd of them coming through the camp. And they're, you can tell they're very used to tourists because they're standing very close to us. You'll read in scripture where, number one, Abraham didn't sacrifice Isaac because there was what? A ram caught in a thicket. And now you can picture why they get caught in thicket. In fact, we're standing there while I'm taking these pictures and one of these jumps up into a tree and got caught for a second. And I was hoping he'd stay there for a minute because I wanted to video him, but he got free too quickly. Um, but they eat these trees and they jump up in. And so that's one image of Abraham and the ram. Another image I want you to have is um, my horn is exalted. A, the horn was a symbol of strength. 
uh, in, in these rams. The, strong, the bigger the horns, the more dominant the animal, the more powerful the animal. So when God has exalted my horn, the horn in scripture, Psalms says it a lot, um, that's the image. It's strength and defense and like I'm, I'm in the care and the authority of God. Um, so that, you can see that's a young one with little horns. There's, you can see that guy's trying to get up into the tree. Um, so this is looking from the, the base of En Gedi back out across the Dead Sea towards, towards Jordan to the east and the plains of Edom and Moab. All right, this is, hmm, I think this is part of En Gedi as well. Same, same basic region along the hills. All right, here we go. No, I, no, I'll tell you what this is. So Jesus comes out of 40 days of temptation and he's gonna go to Jerusalem. The very, this is, we're talking about the first six months of his ministry. He gets baptized, he goes into the wilderness, he comes out of the wilderness, somewhere right in here, John sees him and says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And it would have been out in that same area of Bethabara. And some of John's disciples are from Galilee and they start to follow, or they start to, at this point they don't start to follow him, but they meet him, they meet Jesus. And Jesus interacts with them. And then they're gonna go home and he's gonna go to Jerusalem. Um, so the reason I put this slide in is because this is a part of Jericho. Jericho is not a nice city, it's a big city. Um, it's West Bank and um, so, Going up into the hills from Jericho, you, this is kind of the terrain you're looking at. And this is the ravine that connects Jericho to Jerusalem. It would be about a half day's, maybe a five to six hour walk uphill through this narrow wadi. It's called Wadi Kelt, Q-U-I-L-T, or a ravine or canyon, whatever you wanna call it. Um, but it's over these hills in the distance is Jerusalem. And so this ravine winds up through. These roads built into this hillside. This is a monastery, by the way. It's called St. George's Monastery. This road, along this road, in some of these pictures you might be able to see it, there's an ancient aqueduct. So what is significant about this? Well, in our narrative right now, this is the road Jesus is on after his temptation to go to Jerusalem. But this road goes way back through biblical history. This is, um, this is the road that the Babylonians used to get into Jerusalem. This road comes out at a village, uh, Jeremiah 1. Somebody open, do you have a Bible? Somebody open to Jeremiah 1. Uh, Anathoth, that, never mind, I got it, Anathoth. Anathoth. Anathoth was a village four to five miles northeast of center Jerusalem. This road, empties out into Anathoth. Anathoth was the point of deportation for Israelites into Babylon. So this is a very important road, um, and at one point they built an aqueduct to get water in and out. Uh, so a couple more shots of this, this Judean wilderness and the road leading up into Jerusalem. So this road is all the way, you can't really see it in these photographs, it's just winding its way down in this, in this ravine. Here's another shot where you can see the bottom. This is also the road that Jesus had in mind um, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in this shot, you can actually see the aqueduct right here that wind, it's just a stone uh, gutter that winds its way along. This is another shot of the monastery. It's quite an edifice built into the, into the hillside there and goes back into the rock. More of a close up. Okay, so heading west to Jerusalem, uh, which that brings us to Jerusalem. You guys ready to do Jerusalem? Here we are, 10. Okay, we're good. All right, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at maps in a minute, but let me start with, um, let, me go, let me go back to Google Earth for a second.
Somehow, Google doesn't want to show me daytime here. Let me uh, see if I can fix this. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Everybody in the Middle East just went. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. Okay. All right, here we go. <laughs> What is wrong with this man? I don't know. Okay, here we are. Here's Jerusalem. I'm just losing my bearings here. Okay. So, Jericho, Wadi Kilt, comes up to Anathoth, empties out into Jerusalem. All right. So, we're going to do this 2D first. Come on. Okay. Okay, no, 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 no. There we go. Now, I don't wanna make you dizzy, but I'm gonna rotate this. Right now, we're looking north. Temple Mount is right here. Whoop, nope, I don't wanna do that yet. I don't want to do that either. All right. All right, so let me... Coming up out of Jerusalem, now there's a highway here that, that comes over this ridge through a tunnel, and you're looking out over um, the old city, which is right here and the Kidron Valley, which is right here, and it wraps down around Old City. Kidron Valley, and then the Mount of Olives right here. And it's, it's kind of hard to see the topography, but you have a mountain peak here, a valley, a hill, with a peak of the hill up here, and up here, several peaks. And then this valley, Kidron Valley comes all the way down to here. This is kind of the end of the Kidron Valley. There's a, there's a valley that no longer exists, but it, it used to in Jesus' day called the Teropian Valley it, or the Cheesemaker Valley. I'm not sure why they call it that right there. And then you have a valley called Hinnom, the Hinnom Valley that goes all the way around this way and up. So you have the shape of kind of like a W, which is the Hebrew letter Shin, which is actually, in Hebrew, it's, it's the letter they use to represent the name of God. The reason that's interesting is that God says in the Old Testament, he set his name here. And it actually, when you look at the topography of these valleys, it's actually like God's initial, which is kind of cool. That's just a little bit of tidbit um, information. So, it's a huge city now, you can tell, but the reason I'm gonna rotate this is I'm, we're gonna, we're gonna overlay the maps I've given you onto modern day, okay? So um, I'm gonna rotate this this way. So now we're looking straight up is west, straight down is east, right is north, left is south. Oop. Okay. Okay, here we go. So now I'm gonna zoom in. So if you look at your map, <clears throat> the, uh, the eight and a half by 11 that I gave you, uh, yeah, um, could somebody, one of the staff help me hand out anybody that didn't get one yet? That'd be great. So hold it where you're saying, seeing Jerusalem, first century, and I'm gonna go to my picture of this map, okay? So those online can see it. And what I'm gonna try to do, this is really sensitive. I'm gonna try to make these maps, ah, come on, Carrie, okay. Okay. 
Okay, are you seeing how they, how they overlay? Watch the screen here, okay? So this is your map. This is modern day. Same space, okay? So you might wanna take your pen and just go, you know, put an arrow going up and, and call that west, and left is south, and down is east, and right is north, just to get your bearings. So in modern vernacular, you hear about the western wall. We'll talk about where that is in a minute. So let me give you your bearings on ancient this is first century Jerusalem, okay? And you cannot really um, read the words on the one side of the map, so we put it on the other side as well. But the other side, it's a different vantage point. It, it's like you tilted it and turned it a different direction. So I wanna kinda stay focused on, on this piece. And, and actually, if you just follow me on the screen, you'll probably be able to see the words and everything, okay? So the Kidron Valley is on the eastern side of Temple Mount, which is the lower part of the map. And then you have this giant rectangular section, which is called Temple Mount. This location goes all the way back to Genesis and all the way forward to Revelation, okay? This, this is the epicenter of the Bible story. But let's talk about in Jesus' day. So in Jesus' day, there was what's called the second temple. There have only ever been two temples, Jewish temples on this site. The first one was Solomon's temple. That was destroyed by Babylon. Ezra's group came back at the um, commission of Cyrus, king of Persia. He funded the reconstruction of the temple at the direction of God, it's pretty cool. Isaiah prophesied it 200 years prior and Cyrus fulfilled that prophecy. So the people came back and were building that temple, but they got discouraged, so it stopped being constructed for, I don't know, 10 or 13 years. And then God came back to them and said, hey, come on, get back on mission, and you can read about that story in Zechariah and Haggai. Haggai, those two prophets are the men that spoke to those people and said, get back on mission and rebuilding the temple. So the second temple, um, then leads into the time of Jesus. But Herod the Great, the one that tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby, um, Herod the Great massively expanded that temple and the whole property. So he, he took this site that was Solomon's temple and, he, and he, turned, he, he expanded it, he built a much bigger platform, it's the size of many football fields, I think 12 football fields or something like that. It's huge and he made a much bigger temple. So in the time of Jesus, this was just a glorious, massive, sandstone, you know, beautiful place and a center of Jewish worship and millions of people would come, hundreds of thousands to the, at the very least would come from all over the empire and the known world They would to their pilgrimage to come and worship at the Jewish feast Passover and Feast of Tabernacles and Feast of Pentecost. They would worship um, at this temple, at this grounds, okay? So in the time of Jesus, now remember, this goes all the way back, so let's, let's go to Genesis. What was this in Genesis? It was a mountain called Moriah, where Abraham brought Isaac, and where he did not kill Isaac because he found a ram caught in a thicket. This site is Moriah. It's also called in the Bible Mount Zion. Mount Zion today is, is the peak up here they, that they call Mount Zion. It's just the peak of this, this several peaks. But in Jesus' day and in biblical times, this whole city area was called Mount Zion, okay? Um, so you'll hear it called Mount Zion, you'll hear it called Mount Moriah, you'll hear it called Temple Mount, you'll hear it called Jerusalem. It's all the same basic place. So in Genesis, this is Mount Moriah, in David's day, this was a Jebusite city, a Canaanite city, and he conquered it and built a palace. And this is where the second term city of David comes in. In the Bible, the city of David is Bethlehem. But in modern day, what you hear called the city of David is a portion of this city that is right here where my arrow is. So the original site of ancient Jerusalem is just this little 
finger of land. And it's, a, it's a, like a peninsula. It's got valleys all around it, and it just kind of juts out as, as, as kind of this mound that, that extends out like a finger, okay? And the top of the finger where the hand is, so to speak, is Temple Mount today. Well, in David's day, David came in and he conquered this city. It's really cool how he conquered it. We'll talk about that later. There's a spring called the Gihon Spring that makes this a very uh, livable place. That spring empties out into this valley called the Kidron Valley. And there's a water supply and there's a pool. And so that made it for a good city. Well, David's... um, One of David's warriors found a secret entrance. In the Bible, it's called the gutter. It's a shaft that was built outside the city to protect access to the water supply and to keep enemies from being able to to access it or cut it off. And his men snuck in, basically like underwater, under the tunnels, and and into this place where they were guarding the water supply, killed the guards, and then went up the shaft and got into the city and, and conquered the city. So David moves in and makes this the new capital of Israel. Why did he make this the new capital of Israel? Well, the old capital was called Shiloh. It's about an hour north. Uh, 369 years, Shiloh was the place of worship, the place where the tabernacle was set up, the place where all the feasts happened. Uh, this is where Eli, towards the end of the days at Shiloh, Eli was the priest and Hannah came and prayed. You remember that story, Hannah and Elkanah, and she prayed for Samuel and then she brought Samuel back and Samuel grew up at the tabernacle under Eli and his wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. So Eli grows up there. Well, if you remember when Saul was the king, uh, they lose a battle to the Philistines. The Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and they take it back to Ashkelon and Ashdod, which is where Gaza Strip is. And Gaza Strip is where the Philistines lived. So they lose the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. So this was like a national defeat, a a, a national depression. It's like terrible time in Israel's history where the whole nation slumps into just a defeatist mentality. This This was before David. So when David becomes the king, if you remember, he became king through all kinds of political turmoil and Saul's pride. Saul tried to kill him and all that. But God's chosen David, so he preserves David. David kills Goliath. Finally, he's, he's made king. David then uh, gets the, the, the nation kind of reunited and re, you know, re, revives the patriotism. Not patriotism, he revives the worship of God. He was a man after God's heart. And his desire, his passion was to get that Ark of the Covenant back and to set up a place for that Ark of the Covenant. You know, David wanted to build a temple but God wouldn't let him. Remember God said, you're a man of war. I'm gonna let your son build the temple. You can get ready for it. You can make preparations for it. So David's kingdom was amazing. It was the best time in the nation of Israel spiritually in all of their history. And we're promised that Jesus is the greater David. He's the son of David. He's the one that will occupy the throne of David forever and ever and ever. So David's kingdom was sort of like a foreshadowing of of the blissful uh, future of God's kingdom. So it was a really good time. David was a conqueror, he was a fighter, he fought off the enemies, he led the nation to worship God, he conquered this city, and at the time that he conquered this city, well, he built a palace. So his palace would have been about right there, where the arrow is. And then up the hill was this plateau, this stone plateau that was called a threshing floor. It was owned, I think the guy's name was Oren, right? I'm trying to do this extemporaneously, so if I miss something, forgive me. David decides to buy the the threshing floor. What's a threshing floor? It's where they would take wheat and they would throw it up into the air where there was breeze and wind, and this is a good spot for it because there's, it's a, it's a plateau at the top of a peak and there would have been wind whipping through, and uh, the chaff blows away and the seeds and the good grain falls and then you can gather it. So it was a threshing floor. David said, I want to buy that, and I want to make that a place of worship. So then, through victories and God answering prayer, they got the Ark of the Covenant back. And you remember they were transporting it. This is when Uzzah touches it and dies. They weren't transporting it right. They bring it back into, they bring it to Jerusalem. They set up the tabernacle that they've had in the wilderness, and then at Shiloh, they set it up on this threshing floor. And it's like, oh my goodness, this is like, Victory Day in New York. Um, 
when v, what is it, VE? VE Day? You know, and, 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 and the ticker tape parades and the celebrations and the dance. Everybody's happy that Jerusalem and that the Ark of the Covenant is back. This is when David was dancing and his wife got mad at him uh, for, for making a fool out of himself, but he was so happy that the presence of God, so to speak, was back in Israel, and this is where they kind of celebrated that Jerusalem was their new capital. So this mountain peak, this plateau, became a place of worship now. It was Solomon then that built the first temple on this site. That was destroyed, the second temple was constructed, and then enlarged by Herod and Jesus, before Jesus, and then in Jesus' adult life, and then his ascension, 70 AD, that temple was destroyed. Today, this same site is where you find the Dome of the Rock, the gold building. You all know what I'm talking about? I'll show you pictures of it in a minute. This site is, is real critical, and so much of the life of Jesus and the story of the Bible rotates around this site. So let me give you your bearings on this, on this map, if I can, in terms of, of uh, the old city of Jesus' day, okay? So the Pool of Bethesda, I'm just gonna track, track the arrow and um, I'll point things out. The Pool of Bethesda, which Jesus healed a lame man. Temple Mount, at the northeast, I'm sorry, northwest corner of Temple Mount is Antonia Fortress. This is where the Roman garrison was stationed to police Jewish life during the time of Jesus. And this is where Paul was arrested and taken into protective custody when they're gonna kill him on Temple Mount in the book of Acts. So a Roman garrison that was attached to Temple Mount. Why? Because the Romans were occupying, the Jews had zealots, there was often turmoil and disruption. <laughs> a lot hasn't changed over the last 2,000 years, to be honest, okay? Um, so the, the temple proper with the holy place and the holy of holies, then you have the outer courtyard, which the Gentiles could come to, the court of women, which is as far as the women could go, um, and then inside the Holy of Holies, only the priests could go. At the southern wall of the temple, you had these giant porches wrapping all the way around, really, on this side and on this side, giant porches, which were marketplaces, where they would sell uh, um, offerings and, and sacrificial animals for sale. Huge industry of first century Israel. Outside of this marketplace were a set of steps called the Southern Steps. They were the main entrance into the temple. Um, and then leading out of the temple in the time of David would have been the, the king's palace. In the time of Jesus, that was gone. Um, and this would have just been old city, but there would have been a massive thoroughfare staircase going downhill, wrapping around and down to this valley. And this is the point where the Kidron Valley and the um, Valley of Gehenna, or Hinnom, join, and the um, Teropian Valley. The three valleys come together right there. And so there's a huge pool here called the Pool of Siloam. All right, to give you again some more bearings, you have Caiaphas's home. We're gonna to come to this during the last week of Jesus' life. You have a general location of the Last Supper up here in the upper city. You have Herod's palace up in the upper city against the outer wall. You have um, two locations where Calvary could be. One is right here, which today is called the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and one is over here, which today is called Gordon's Calvary and the Garden Tomb. I'll show you uh, both of those locations. Okay, so let's overlay that on Google Earth. So do you lose it or do you still see it? Still see it a little bit? So let me give you a little bit of your bearings. Kidron Valley is right here. Uh, it wraps all the way around. This is the ancient city of David. The king's palace would have been about right here. Or no, right here, I'm sorry, where my hand is. The southern steps to the temple would have been right here. 
You have Temple Mount, which is still the same basic shape. Today you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque right here. You have the Dome of the Rock right here. Then you have this vast empty space. Um, this would have been Antonia Fortress over here. Pool of Bethesda is still right here to this day. The, the excavations are there. Gordon's Calvary or the Garden Tomb is out of the old city over this direction. Church of the Holy Sepulchre is right here. You see, the old city of Jesus' day was smaller. And the, so the walls expanded. So where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Catholic site is today, would have been, see, right now, right now it's in the city. In Jesus' day, it would have been out of the city. So um, there's split opinions on whether Jesus was crucified and buried here. And if that's the case, there's absolutely nothing left of it. I mean, it's been raised and built and raised and built over different centuries and different empires a dozen or more times. If it's over here, then it's really cool. The Garden Tomb and Gordon's Calvary uh, is still kind of intact. You can kind of still see it for what it would have been. So that's pretty cool. Um, just to give you your bearings, the Western Wall is right here. And the old city today, I'm just gonna do some outlining of it. It goes like this. Yeah, comes up and around and then back down. And it's all walled in, but, but most of the walls existing were built you know, um, hundreds of years ago, not thousands. But some of the remnants of the, of the original walls are still there. What I want you to have in mind for your biblical reference is this view, okay? Because the old city of Jesus' day was, was everywhere I'm tracing right now, coming up to Temple Mount. And especially going back to the most ancient of days, which is where uh, the city David conquered is right here. So the walls that Nehemiah rebuilt would have been around this little finger of land this peninsula. The palace of David and Solomon was here. The, the threshing floor that, that David bought was here. Okay, so having said all that, let's go to some pictures. Let me go out of that. So Jesus comes over the Mount of Olives, down through the um, Kidron Valley to the Pool of Siloam, up the staircase, which I'll show you later. As he's going, down the Mount of Olives, he would have been looking up at that gate of Temple Mount. That's what's called the Eastern Gate. So to show you on Google Earth where that gate is, it's right there. So this is the top of the Mount of Olives in the lower part of the photo. The Garden of Gethsemane is right here, which will come to all that. The eastern gate is right here. So Jesus would have walked this valley all the way down to right here is the Pool of Siloam. And then we'd have walked a grand staircase up to the temple and up these southern steps into the temple grounds. Okay, so this is, I'm just gonna cruise through pictures of Temple Mount uh, to save some time. And we're gonna take a break here in just a second. Um, so top of Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, what is in that building is just the peak of the plateau. And it is where tradition says Moses was going to offer Isaac. That's why that Dome of the Rock is so um, important biblically. It's, it's important to Muslims because they have this tradition that this is where um, Muhammad did something spectacular, I'm not even sure, but um, you know, it's a hijacking of, of, of biblical narrative. This is on Temple Mount looking south towards the Al-Aqsa Mosque, so that the steps would have been behind that structure. No, I'm sorry, this is looking west, up towards the Muslim quarter of the city. You can just see it's a vast, vast place. So now we're looking um, north, so Antonia Fortress would have been up here in this corner, and it's this vast open space. So that building, this little 
dome building or, or one of them. No, 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 I'm trying to remember when, okay. Let me take you back in time a little bit. This same site, this is a model in Jerusalem of what it would have looked like in Jesus' day. So we're looking at this temple from the top of the Mount of Olives in this photo. The Kidron Valley would be down here below us. Eastern Gate, the temple, the inner temple, the courtyard with the, with the porches and the marketplace, and then the southern steps going down into the old city. And then Antonia Fortress up here, and then Caiaphas' house in the upper city off to the left. So I uh, already showed you your model. All right, um, I wanna show you this piece of artwork because this, this is now looking from the, uh, it's a southern view of the temple looking north. Am I losing you? You guys with me? So if you took your map, if you took that map and did this, okay, now we're standing down at the bottom of the map looking up at it, okay? So in first century, the Kidron Valley wraps around what is today the ancient city of David, comes to the pool of Siloam. Everybody coming into town had to stop at this pool, ceremonially cleanse, to purify themselves coming into the city. What's the picture? I can't get to heaven unless I'm clean. I can't get to the city of God, to the place of God. I can't come to the presence of God unless I'm clean. So that begs the question, how do I get clean? Religion says you get clean by being good, by keeping laws. That was never God's idea, that's never in the Bible. In fact, the Bible tells us exactly the opposite. You don't get clean by being good. The, the whole message of the laws of scripture is look how good you aren't. Look how, 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 you, how deeply you need to be cleaned. So the idea of all this imagery of the, of the sacrifices and the water and the cleaning and all that, the cleansing, the whole idea is God saying, I'm gonna cleanse you. I'm gonna make a way to make you clean so you can come to me. So what's the way God makes us clean? Jesus. Jesus came and died on a cross to pay for our sins so that he, he makes us clean. The thing is, if you say, well, I go to church, I give, I was baptized, I was confirmed, I do confession, I go through all the ceremonies, I go through all the rituals, listen, that's what I call the do religions. And there are many of them, by the way. I'm not talking about any one religion, but they all come along and say, here's what you have to do to make yourself clean. But Jesus came along and said, no, it's about believing. You don't achieve your salvation, you receive it. You let, you let me make you clean by faith. And that happens by belief. Jesus said it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So as we're sitting here and as you're online, you need to be, you, uh, this, this needs to be more than just intriguing. It needs to be, wait, am I trying to clean myself up for God? Because that's not salvation. Can you say, yeah, I remember a moment when I released all of my trust in myself and my own goodness, my own efforts, and I put all of my trust in Jesus and what he did on the cross, and he, makes, he made me clean in that moment. He saved me, he forgave me. The Bible has a lot of terms for that, justification, salvation, new birth. It's the moment that you're dead and you come to life. God brings you back to life, and in his eyes, you're exonerated, you're justified. You're, you're declared guilt-free in the courtroom of heaven, not because you're good enough, but because Jesus paid the price. So the picture of the water, the picture of the sacrifices in the temple, all of it was God saying, you can't come to me, you can't come into the kingdom or the city of God or heaven forever unless you've been cleaned by me, and Jesus is the only way to do that. That's why the religious leaders hated Jesus so much, was because he was tearing down their money-making system. He was, tell, he was setting people free. He was saying, you don't have to keep all these crazy laws that these guys made up and invented. You just need to believe in the work that I'm doing for you and let me save you, and they were free. So I lost the TV in the back, Brent. I don't know if that uh, is a time issue. Okay, we're okay. I want you to see on this drawing, though, the, the old city of David is right here. David's palace would have been right here. It was gone by the time of Jesus. 
the Pool of Siloam, a huge pool, which today is being excavated, it's very cool, and a wide staircase, processional staircase, that goes up through the city, this is like Main Street, and they used this for processionals during the feasts in Jesus' day. So Jesus would have walked this staircase dozens of times in his life, and then entering either the southern steps or through one of these archways into the temple grounds, okay? So that's a good piece of artwork to give you your bearings on on where we're at, okay. Um, So, moving along, Jesus goes into the temple after his temptation and he clears things out. Remember that? Drives them all out, they hate him already because he says, this, you're, you've, you've totally perverted what this space was supposed to be. This was supposed to be a house of prayer, a place of mercy, uh, a mercy seat, a place where atonement for sins and where God and man were reunited and this Jerusalem religious leaders cartel has come in, a criminal syndicate, and they've, they've layered God's system with perversion and corruption and extortion and they're vastly wealthy, millions and millions of dollars these guys live in opulence and mansions in the city, and they hated Jesus because he's telling people, beware of these deceivers, beware of these false teachers, beware of these oppressors, they can't save you. So we're gonna time out here, 11.11. I'm gonna start again at 11.20 on my clock, not that clock, 11.20, I'm at 11.11 right now, and we're gonna go to Galilee. We still gotta get to Galilee. We gotta talk about the life, the ministry of Jesus, and then we're gonna talk through the death the last week of Jesus. And then we'll probably have to do this again. Okay. 1120, on your mark, get set, go.
creation was, you were our home. A dwelling place of time and space in galaxies unknown. From ages past, you've given us a name before the mountains were lifted from the plains. Oh, I'm running home where the love is always greater than my failures ever were. But all that matters now is my heart of surrender to the God who always takes my pain in turn. Fathers run to wayward sons with heavenly embrace. It's where the orphan finally finds a name. It's where you love us all the same. Two minutes. We're going to start. Two minutes. Okay, let's get started. Come on down. Let's do this. Come on down. Okay. Just to correct the record, I think I said Moses was going to sacrifice Abraham or Isaac. 
That's the kind of thing I'm afraid of, you know, especially that we're live streaming this. So Abraham was the one that was gonna sacrifice Isaac. Moses and Isaac were good buddies. They, he would never have harmed Isaac. <laughs> Moses is just a several hundred years later, that's all. Um, Okay, and I think I did get my timeline a little mixed up here. Jesus, after his temptation, he goes north to Cana of Galilee and does his first miracle. And so I do wanna show you uh, where Cana is, and then we'll pick up speed a little bit. We're gonna come back to Jerusalem, so hold on to that thought. I slowed way down the, uh, the Zoom feature so you wouldn't get sick, but it's a little too slow now. All right, so I need to turn this. Nope, this way. Sorry. I know. Okay. So Jesus um, begins his earthly ministry at Cana of Galilee, and you know the story of the wedding and the water to wine. So that is right up here by Nazareth. There's a couple locations that could be Cana, but there's actually one still called Cana. Um, And so that's typically where we stop when we are coming through Nazareth, through Cana. Um, And the interesting thing to see in Cana is the excavation of a first century Jewish synagogue. Now, anywhere in Galilee, when you come across an excavation of a Jewish synagogue that dates back to the first century, 100% you can say, Jesus taught here, because that's what he did. For the better part of two and a half years, he's in this region of of Galilee. So in Cana of Galilee, there's these excavations that they uncovered, and they dated back to first century of a synagogue. So in those excavations, they found these water pots. And that's a picture of a first century water pot. So is that one of them? I don't know, could be, maybe, we don't know. But that's what they looked like. That's pretty cool. So, and that's on display there in Cana. All right. Um, From Cana, Jesus goes briefly to the village of Capernaum, which I'm, we're gonna come back to it. I'm just gonna show you where it is. It's right here on the North Shore. Um, I wanna say it takes a couple days journey to, to walk that. Um, but he goes then, he waits at Capernaum until Passover. It's time for Passover, so he goes back south to Jerusalem. That's when he cleanses the temple. Um, and now, He's coming out of Jerusalem after the cleansing of the temple and after Passover, and he's gonna go back north to to begin his ministry in Galilee. So I wanna just track him. And on this occasion, he says to his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. So typically, they would have gone back down Wadi Kelt and back up the Jordan Valley. And some people say, well, that's because they hated the Samaritans and there's racial tension, nobody would go through Samaria. It's more likely that it's because the the Samaria route was a much harder route. It was shorter, but it was much more arduous. Coming out of Jerusalem, it's downhill through that valley, and then you're going up the Jordan Valley, and it's generally a flat walk most of the way, and then you're up through the Jezreel Valley, and that's generally a flat walk, so you don't have a lot of climbing to do until you get to Nazareth. If you're gonna go straight north out of Jerusalem on what's called the Road of the Patriarchs, you're gonna be doing some really hard, heavy climbing and hiking the whole way. It's down and up and down and up and down and up. Um, So there's just no easy road to walk. But he said he needed to go to to Samaria. Why? Well, we know he's got an appointment there. In the Gospel of John, John tells us he goes to the well of Jacob, Jacob's well, and he meets a woman of Samaria. You guys remember the story, right? The woman at the well, okay? So let's track that journey together for a minute because like I said, we're on the spine. This is the spine of the country and you can see the hills going uh, both directions. Let's go ahead and um, tilt the map a little bit. Whoa, okay. 
So we're gonna go out of, of uh, Jerusalem. And as soon as we cross this red line, modern day, we're into West Bank. So all of this region was Northern Kingdom in the Old Testament. Going back to Genesis, this was kind of the stomping grounds of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At different times in the narrative, they're at different locations. And they kind of span all the way down here to Beersheba, which is, come on. Okay, right there, Beersheba. So there's ruins there today that date back to Abraham and Isaac. Very cool. Uh, and then the, the next really cool site related to them is Hebron. This is actually where the patriarchs are buried. Um, and then you follow this spine, you come to Jerusalem. Coming out of the spine, modern day, you're talking Ramallah. Uh, you're talking Nablus is up in here somewhere. Uh, Nablus is right here. And then um, these are all cities you're hearing about in the news. Janine is up in here. All right, so let's go back uh, to Jerusalem. And we're gonna, I wanna show you two sites that are really cool that Jesus would have passed. He would have had to have passed these on his way north. The first is Bethel, which goes back to Genesis and, and um, Jacob wrestling with God. So you see the words on the screen, Beit El. That uh, Beit is house, El is God. House of God, Bethel, okay? And so um, several of the patriarchs spent time on this outcropping this rock, um, and this is where Jacob laid his head on the rocks and slept, and it's not where he wrestled with God, it's where he had his dream of the ladder. So this is the, this is the um, topography, beautiful in spring. Um, actually, this is Shiloh. Let me get out of this and go to Bethel. All right, here we go. I wanted to show you, the, you know, going up into, into, these, into this country, it's very rugged, but it's also very fertile. This is just me taking pictures as we're driving. You can see the terraces, though, on the hillsides. Um, it's, not very, it's not uncommon to see piles of rocks, which would have been ancient altars, and they're just still there. Um, high places, the Bible calls them. These are all Palestinian cities or neighborhoods that are built into this West Bank. Um, this is the kind of land that uh, Joseph and his brothers grazed their sheep. And again, you see the terraces on the hillsides. Okay, so this is Bethel. This is the site of an old church that's there. The interesting piece of, of, about this outline right here is it's the, it's, it's the same outline as the tabernacle. It's the same size space as the tabernacle. And it's the remnants of Jeroboam's Old Testament pagan worship site. It's still there. And he just tried to do a duplicate of what was in Jerusalem with the tabernacle um, in the north and south of the northern kingdom and set up a place of worship and set up a pagan altar and probably some sort of golden image or calf or something like that. So, but that's the remnant of that site. So on the site of Bethel, you've got Abraham setting up an altar, you've got Isaac visiting there, you've got Jacob setting up an altar and having the vision of the angels on the ascending and descending. Jesus later said, I am that ladder, I'm the access to heaven. Um, and, and I think it's Jacob that said, this is, this is the place where God is, this is God's house. So it's right there on that peak. This is where Abraham and Lot stood. And Abraham said, hey, let's not have any tension between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. Why don't you pick your direction and I'll pick my direction. And Lot looks and chooses the well-watered plains of Sodom. So this is looking towards the well-watered plains of Sodom. And on a clear day, you can see the hills of Jordan right there where that red arrow is and the Jordan Valley is right over that last ridge. So in this spot is where Lot said, hey, I think I'll go that direction and you can have this hill country. God told Abraham, stay in the hill country. And that was the place of faith. Lot chose the place of sight. There's a lot of water, there's a lot of fertile ground there. Abraham's gotta stay in the hill country. What does that mean? It means God has to send rain. Total dependence on God because there's not a lot of water sources outside of, uh, of rain. 
Um, on that site, there's still tombs, there's still caves. It's just a, a remarkable place. So going back to the map, Jesus is journeying north. You guys okay with me jumping back and forth in time? Okay, if, if I'm losing you, let me know. All right, so, so coming north, I'm looking for Shiloh. Here it is. The next really important site we come to is called Shiloh. You'll see on the screen, it says Tell Shiloh. Tell means city. Um, and the Tells in Israel are ancient cities. They're mounds. Some of them are excavated. Some of them are not. And they're just called Tells. Many of them. You'll be driving and your guide will say, you see that mountain right there? And it looks like a hill. And you look a little closer and you realize, oh, that's more than a hill. It's got some kind of shape to it. And he'll say, that's a tell. That's a city. For instance, Goliath's hometown, Gath. It's just a mound with trees and grass. And you look at it and you think it's a mountain, but it's a city. It's just not excavated. They've never had the money or the time. It would take billions and billions of dollars and billions of man hours to excavate. The whole country is an archaeological site, like everywhere. Um, and in some of these places, you can see where the excavations took place for a little while and then they stopped. And you can yourself find pottery and you, you're, it's free to take. I've got an office full of it back here. You think, shouldn't that be in a museum somewhere? It's trash to them. They, 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 they find these pottery shards and they just throw it all away. It's amazing to me. They keep the coins and the cool stuff. <laughs> so Shiloh is where the first capital of Israel was in Joshua's day. So this is where the tribes came to meet for their feasts and their festivals, where they came to worship. I talked about it earlier. It is today a tell. It's very well excavated. And what's cool about this, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it, it's a miniature of Jerusalem. Topographically, it is a miniature of Jerusalem. And here's how I, here's how I would point it out to you. You'd have to take your map and flip it. You'd have to look at it upside down. Okay, but to contrast it to ancient Jerusalem, this would be Mount Zion, the peak of Mount Zion. This would be the Kidron Valley, the Teropian Valley, the Hinnom Valley. This would be Temple Mount. This would be the upper city. This would be the city of David right here. It's shaped topographically exactly like Jerusalem. And what's cool about it is Jerusalem, you're, in the, you're breathing smog and you're hearing bus horns and, and, and the call to worship from the, from the Muslim horns. It's, it's just chaos. It's like being in Manhattan. And it's really hard to imagine the biblical sense of things. But when you're in Shiloh and you stand there and you're looking out at these hills, you're like, oh, this would have been like what Jerusalem looked like before anything was built on, on a smaller scale. So it's really cool. And what they have excavated is the whole, basically the whole city, and then going down to this area down here where the tabernacle was set up, exactly positioned in the hills and in the valleys where Temple Mount is set up. Oh no, it happened again, Brent, help me up. Unplug, okay, it came back, all right. This happened a little while ago and it made me nervous, all right. Maybe that's the Lord saying, hey, hurry up. Okay. <laughs> so Shiloh, just panoramic of Shiloh. This is facing um, west. This is walking into town. This is walking, that's, that's facing uh, east. So over the hills is the Jordan Valley. Um, this is now going up onto the tell or the, the mound that's been excavated. So in this photo, um, we're walking up this, this area right here to this, this structure is at the top of this hill. And so now I'm just panoramic, you know, panoramic view of the region. You can see it's very agricultural. Now I'm standing at the top of the tell looking down towards where the worship place was. So you can see the structure, the, the stone walls still the remnants, the foundations, I should say, of the stone walls of where the tabernacle would have been, which is the foreshadowing of the temple in Jerusalem, which is the foreshadowing of the throne room of heaven. So very, very cool. So if this were Jerusalem, we'd be looking at Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. 
Um, so we're kind of looking at it the other direction now. And the, the temple, or the, the tabernacle would have been in here, the outer courtyard here, and, um, and then in the, in the Jerusalem model, this would be the, the lower city of David. Okay, what's important about this picture is this was 369 years where they came to worship as their capital. This is where the Ark of the Covenant got taken from. This is where Hannah prayed for her son Samuel. This is where Samuel grew up, and Eli was the priest, and uh, it, it became a real, a real sad story. More shots of Shiloh, just traveling through the region. I think I showed you those already. Okay, so yeah, we can zoom out of this now. Go back to the map. And let's uh, continue to track Jesus. Because he, uh, he doesn't stop at Bethel or Shiloh that we know of, he just continues north to make his meeting at Nablus, which I'm looking for on this map here. Okay, here we go. So, Jesus comes into this valley, heading back to Galilee, uh, and he meets a woman at a well and Jacob's well is right there at the tip of the finger, okay? Now, to give you your biblical bearings on this site, Genesis, this is where Joseph, is, this is Shechem in Genesis. This is where Joseph and his brothers were keeping their sheep. This is where Joseph got sold into slavery. Um, so in Jesus' day, it's Samaria, and the Jews don't like the Samaritans. You know, many of you know the story of that. So he meets a woman at this well. Today, this is all West Bank. The Jewish people cannot even go, they can't even go into this city in Nablus. We didn't go into it, we went up above it on Mount Gerizim. But in the book of Joshua, um, Moses told Joshua, when you go into the land, go to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and have the Levites stand in the valley, and have the tribe stand on the two mountains, and recite the book of Deuteronomy. Basically, read the book of Deuteronomy, and re-covenant um, yourselves into a relationship with me at Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. So you can read about that in the book of Joshua. You can read about the instructions of it in the book of Deuteronomy. So the, the Mount, uh, Mount Gerizim is right here, and Mount Ebal is right here. So it, it overlooks this valley, this area where they graze their sheep, and where later Jesus meets this woman at the well. It's um, today, ironically, when we were there, we drove up to Mount Gerizim, we got to the ruins right here, and there's ruins on both mountain peaks that, that validate the biblical story. Hebrew writing, it's really, really cool. The Samarit, there's still a Samaritan village right here, and they still go up and have their worship ceremonies every year on the top of this mountain, which is pretty cool. The, the uh, crazy thing about looking from this mountain down into this valley is that Jacob's well is right in the middle of town. There's a big church on it. Right next to Jacob's well is the UN, and right next to the UN is a refugee camp that trains terrorists. It's the craziest thing. And we're looking down on this camp, and our guide, our Jewish guide says, more, more terrorists have come from that place than any other place on the, on the planet. Um, and, and I was like, Are, should we be here right now? Are you sure? <laughs> and, and he had a gun in his, in his back belt. He's like, I'm glad you've got that gun, but there's only like nine bullets in that. Um, so, uh, hope I can run faster than him. So let me go to, oh, I'm looking for it here. Okay, Judea, Samaria. Let's just crank through these pictures. So this is what the topography looks like in the spring. Olive trees. Okay, now this is up on Mount Gerizim, looking down into that valley to the south. This is in the valley before we went to Mount Gerizim. This is on top, this is the ruins on top of Mount Gerizim, looking down, so Jacob's well is down this way. Oh, okay, Here, it, was, it was just slowing down, okay. All right, so this is looking down into Nablus, which is the capital of the Palestinian state today. 
This is the, uh, the refugee camp right here. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna zoom in on it in a minute and you'll get a better view. Okay, here you go. See this church right here? Right there? That's where Jacob's well is. So uh, obviously, this was raw land when Jesus met that woman. This building is the UN, and this is the refugee camp where they're training terrorists. So it's, it's just, it's like, it just breaks my brain at that point. You, you have, the, you have the, the fountain of living water offering life, and humanity says, no, we'll do it our own way, and you have a disaster of, of, of humanity. So it just it really is an amazing thought. Great, let me uh, zoom out of that photo. So this is more of the same, just, just showing you the ravines and looking uh, east towards the Jordan Valley. That's the UN building and, and the church where uh, the well is. Okay, and that is an aerial shot. I just downloaded that from somewhere. I didn't take that, but it's an aerial shot of Mount Gerizim, the ruins. The, the camp and the church are down off to the left, and this valley goes off to the west. Okay. So uh, let's go back to Google Earth and continue to track Jesus north. So that's where the account of John, was it five or six, where he meets the woman at the well? All right. So Jesus would have come out into the Jezreel Valley somewhere about right here. And what's interesting about this location is this is Mount Gilboa. This is where Saul died. This, is, this valley is where Gideon fought the Midianites. So Gideon's well, a Gideon's spring, I should say, is right over this hill. And this is where the capital of Jezreel was, Ahab's palace. So before we track Jesus into Galilee, let me just show you some of those sites real quick. All right. Yeah, yeah, okay, just trying to get my bearings here. All right, Gideon Spring, this is a slope that goes down into this valley, it's kinda hard to tell that right here. But right here is the Spring of Gideon, and that is gonna be right, so this is, um, that's Jezreel. The Spring of, so, the valley, looking from the spring of Gideon across to um, not Goboa, Hill of Moray. The Midians were camped on this hill. The battle happened in this field. This is the spring, part of the spring. Looking out at Moray, the hill in the back, and the field where the battle took place. I, I threw this in there because there's just picture, there's pits everywhere. Um, and in some cases they were cisterns for water, in some cases they were caves, but when you hear about Joseph being thrown into a pit or you read Psalms, he's lifted me out of the pit, taken me out of a miry pit. This is, I mean, this one was fenced in, but there's, there's plenty of them all over the place that are not fenced in. Um, so I wanted to throw that in here. Here's Gideon's spring. Oh, oh, you, oh, okay. Okay, this is the location of Gideon's spring. That's the spring. That's where the soldiers were, were drinking the water and he ended up with 300 guys and went, uh-oh. So that's the spring, it's a cool place, and the hill goes up from there, the hills. That's another shot of the spring. You can still drink the water if you trust it. I survived. Um, okay, and then right around the corner from that spring, right here, is an unexcavated tell or mound called uh, Jezreel. So this is the, no, I don't want to spin. Yeah, I want to, I want to do this. You can see how, how it goes down from this point. But this is um, not excavated, but it is the location of the city of Jezreel. You'll read about that in the story of Elijah and Elisha. This is where Ahab's palace was. This is where um, Jezebel died. Um, so we have climbed out there, 
Kurt and I and some friends, and I'm running across this thing, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is not excavated. Maybe I should watch my step. So this is looking, um, so Gideon Spring is to the right of this photo. Hill of Moray is straight ahead. The battle where, the, where Gideon fought the Midianites is right in front of us, the Valley of Jezreel. And these are the ruins of ancient Jezreel. And these are parts of Ahab's palace. And you could tell they started the excavation and then stopped it. And it's fenced off, but we climbed the fence. <laughs> so we're looking out towards the hill of Moray and looking north towards Nazareth. Nazareth is out over these, in these hills. So the reason I'm showing you this picture is it's Old Testament, but it's also the route Jesus took through Samaria and then up, back up to Galilee. So this is all the top of the city, and you can see it. None of it, this is all unexcavated. Uh, Gideon Spring is at the base of this hill. This is Mount Goboa. This is Jordan Valley out there. And uh, we're back on the ground. Okay, so I'm gonna go to 12.15 and then we have lunch, if you guys are okay with that. And then wherever we're at at 12.15, we will uh, pick it up there later. All right, let me zoom, let me zoom back out. All right, so Jesus is gonna go to Capernaum. And this is my favorite part of, uh, of Israel. So this is the Sea of Galilee. So let me give you your bearings a little bit. It is just a few miles across and a little more than that long. You can see the whole lake from just about every, but every place around the lake. You can see the whole thing. So it's more like a big lake than a sea. It does get very windy and very choppy, so the storms are a real thing. On this side of the lake is the city of Tiberias. It was a Roman city. We don't have any, there's no record that Jesus ever went there. Um, he taught in the, in the villages and synagogues, and he, he, he mostly taught to the Jewish people. Okay, across the lake, this region is the region of the Gadarenes, or Gadara, or it's also called Decapolis. Deca is 10, Polis is cities, 10 cities. There's 10 cities in this region that wrap around the southern part of the lake. Um, so where the demons were cast out of the man and into the herd of swine happens somewhere along these hills. There's only one or two locations, really one primary location where it's steep enough where you can imagine something like that happening. Everything else is kind of a gentle slope down into the water. But right over here, there's a, there's a spot that's pretty steep. So when you read about Jesus going to the other side, it's, it's over here, okay? Um, when you come into this region from Nazareth, you, you come down these hills uh, out through a valley right here into the region of Magdala, or it's also called Dalmanutha in scripture, okay? So I'm gonna start right here in a minute with photographs. There's a mountain here I wanna show you that looks down on this region, but I wanna give you the, the, your, your bearings. So Magdala, where Mary of Magdalene was from, is right here. As you go around a little further, you come to a spot called Tafka, which is where they parked their fishing boats and washed their nets. And it's just a short walk from the village of Capernaum. The reason, Capernaum's huge. It's the hometown of Jesus for two and a half years. It's where he home-based his ministry once he got rejected in Nazareth. If you remember, he tried to go do great works in Nazareth. He read in the synagogue. They were angry at him because he said, this day the scripture's fulfilled. And they took him out to a cliff. They're gonna kill him. And he passed through and he went to Capernaum. He's already interacted with Peter, James, John, some of the disciples a few times. They're building a relationship with him and he's getting to know them. So after he gets back from his, from his journey south, they end up in, back in Capernaum. The, the guys are back at their fishing business now. And uh, he begins to home base here. So two and a half years he's gonna be here. So let's, let's look at this region from this mountain up here called Arbel, okay? Um, Mount Arbel. So 
you're gonna see it from multiple vantage points. This is looking up at it, obviously, from the valley that's close to Magdala. This is uh, looking up the valley towards Nazareth that goes through this ravine. Same thing, this is the, the mountain looking down, Magdala, the Sea of Galilee's off to the left. You can hike this, there's caves up in here, there's a lot of history to it, uh, but it's just massive cliffs. So this is up on top of Mount Arbel, looking down towards Galilee. I've got some better photos in a minute, but this just gives you an idea of the region. Um, this is the ravine that goes off to the west, and what's significant about this is I'm gonna show you in a minute some pictures of an unexcavated village right here on this hillside. All they've excavated is the synagogue. And again, synagogue, Galilee, 100% for sure Jesus taught there. So it's really cool. All right, so this is from the top of Mount Arbel looking at the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Um, so Magdala is right down over this rock. Capernaum is up over here. Bethsaida is across the lake on the north side. And then the hills that you can't see ascend up out of the region. I just threw a few pictures in here. It was a beautiful day. The sun was breaking through the clouds and you can see that, that's the hills going back towards Nazareth. So this is spring. This is looking down on the same shot of the north shore of Galilee. Magdala over this rock. Capernaum right here. Bethsaida across the lake. Gadara over here. Okay. Same shot, different vantage, different angle. Different season, same shot. This is climbing down. So on one trip, we just did the hike down from the top of our bell down to the valley. And uh, you can see these caves. It's pretty arduous uh, walk down. I don't know why those goats fascinated me, but. So this is in spring, the same cliff in springtime. This is called the Jesus Trail, and it's the same thing. Our bell is off to the left, Sea of Galilee is behind me. And if you walk this trail, you end up in Cana and Nazareth. And plenty of people do it. They hike it, they backpack it, whatever. Um, but this is one of those that you go, did Jesus ever walk here? 100%, absolutely yes. Every time he went from Nazareth to Galilee, he would have taken this trail, or to Capernaum. Okay, this is a home in the rocks of that village that I told you was not excavated. Uh, it's, it's just one house, and then up on this platform to the left, is a, um, a synagogue. So you can see the basalt. The basalt is first century. That, that's what they built with in the first century. When you see uh, limestone and others, that's been rebuilt. So you'll see that in a minute. So, but you can see that this is, this is first century synagogue built into this hill, hillside. There's an olive press there, the weights to crush the olives, uh, more of the synagogue. You can see the benches that outlined it. Um, so I love these sites because not many tourists go to these places. It, these are just kind of out of the way. Hardly any buses go here. And, but you're standing and you're going, yeah, Jesus taught here for sure. So I, just, I could sit there all day. Herd of sheep in the hills. So, okay, so let's go on. Uh, what's next? Let's go to Magdala. This is awesome. So they were building a hotel in Magdala. It's right on the water. Let me go back to Google Earth and show you where it is. So we're right on the shore of Galilee now. Right here. I almost died here last year. Seriously, I'll show you how. Um, okay, so our bell is right here, the top of our bell, and that valley we were looking at is right there. So you drive around the corner and this is, this is the village of Magdala, it was right here, and even across the road on this side. So they're gonna build this hotel, none of it was excavated, and in Israel, you've gotta pull permits, and they've gotta bring in historians and archeologists to test the soil, and where are you gonna dig, and what's there, and they found a village. So they told the hotel, you, you can only build here, and you've gotta excavate the rest of this, and you, so the hotel people made this a site, um, and, They've, they have uncovered this entire massive Jewish village, two synagogues, which was unusual, and um, 
it, this was a, a corrupt place. It's where the wealthy religious leaders stayed, and it was very active with um, prostitution. And so this is why Mary's history plays into this. And it shows you kind of the corruptness of the religious leaders of the day. So this is the excavation. You can see the hotel built right up against it. But what we're looking at here is the synagogue of Magdala. That square is the synagogue. So did Jesus teach in that synagogue? 100% yes. Probably more than once. Um, and th I'm just gonna show you different shots of the synagogue. This stone, they dug, they, they unearthed this stone. The, the, it, that's a replica, the real one. I, I can't remember if the real one's in the museum or at the hotel, there's one in the hotel too. It's the podium, it's the top of the podium of the lectern of the synagogue. And I'm telling you, that's just first century for sure. Jesus taught there. Um, but you can see the seats and the setting See how, see, you know what I love about this picture? You can tell this was not a Baptist church. <laughs> because everybody had to sit close. And in 21st century America, everybody sits in the back. So, so if this were a Baptist church, Jesus would have stood here and taught and everybody else would be sitting back here. <laughs> and everything in between just be a vast canyon. Is that me? Sorry about that. All right, let me go back through some things in Magdala. So just the ruins of Magdala. Uh, aerial shot again of, uh, I don't know why I put that in there. Oh, we're going the wrong direction now. Okay, back to Magdala. Here's the waterfront of Magdala. Looking towards Capernaum. Looking toward the North Shore. Oh, sorry about that. This is the guy that almost killed me. I'll tell you about that in a second. So that's looking back from Magdala, from the waterfront, up towards Mount Arbel, where I showed you all the, the pictures from the peak a moment ago. All right, so my last trip there, no, next to last trip there, this was last January. I was there with five friends and um, it was nighttime, we got to this hotel, we checked in and it was nighttime, but I wanted to go out to the waterfront. And you can see how empty this area is. And they had a lit area and a lit area and a dark area in between. And I went out to the lit area by the waterfront and I thought I wanna to go to that lit area, but I don't wanna come all the way back around, I just gonna go across the dark area. And your brain says, there's nothing, it's just sand. So I'm walking dumbly in the dark, answering an email, probably from one of you. <laughs> I noticed this week in my reading that Moses, when he, right before he died, he goes, most of you know I'm not gonna go into the promised land because of you guys. He blames them, you know? <laughs> He's the one that struck the rock. He's like, because of you guys. He, I just thought that was funny. So anyway, I find that if, if Moses can blame everybody else, I'll do the same. So I literally, in pitch blackness, end up falling headfirst over that stump, and it's, it's this big. And before I knew what hit me, I had landed with my full weight on my sternum. And I, I literally thought I either impaled myself or broke in my sternum, you know? Uh, I'm thinking, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be in the hospital. This is the end of this trip for me. And fortunately, I just maybe bruised myself pretty significantly. But my, when I got back, Dana was like, oh my goodness, my whole chest was, was black and blue for that stupid stump. And it was my fault, my total dumb fault. I don't walk in the dark anymore. Okay, so that's Magdala. So Jesus' home base is in Capernaum. Let's zoom out a little bit and talk about Capernaum because you read in the Gospels a lot about Capernaum and this is just one of my favorite places. Okay, whoop, I passed it. Here it is, okay. So if I zoom out, you'll read in the Gospel, woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto the Bethsaida. And he mentions Capernaum in the same passage. Why? Because Jesus spent two and a half years in this region, but it did an enormous, we're talking probably tens of thousands of miracles were done between Capernaum, Chorazin is right there, Bethsaida is over here. 
So this triangle area, this is all low lands against the water, and this is all, this is, the hills go, go up quickly, so Chorazim is up on the hill, a city set on a hill, okay? So Jesus lives in Capernaum, calls his disciples to follow him, leave their nets, and they followed him in Capernaum. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He uh, healed the paralytic through the house that came down through the roof. I mean, so many of the miracles that you read about, lepers, I mean, either right in or right outside of Capernaum. Um, he taught the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7, outside of Capernaum, the Mount called Mount Beatitudes, that's right here. Uh, the, the places where the guys washed their nets is right along the shoreline here because there's natural springs that come into the Sea of Galilee at this point. Um, the, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus gets into the boat from Capernaum, goes to the other side, which is over here, four miles. They're up in this ver, uh, fertile hill country area by Bethsaida. By the way, remember, this is the intersection that I talked about, which happens to form a cross. You've got the highway coming from the north, and it splits and goes around the lake. So all the people coming in for Passover or going to Africa or Arabia for commerce, this is the juncture. But Jesus is going up into these hills and the crowds from this intersection follow him. Why? Because they want healing. Thousands and thousands of people. We estimate 15 to 25,000 people that day. And he's trying to spend time alone with the disciples. But this is where the feeding of the 5,000 happens. He tells the disciples, get back in the boat. They're supposed to go four miles to home, but they get lost in the storm and they row for eight hours through the night. Don't know where they are. They're totally disoriented, totally lost. Jesus is up here praying in the mountains, sees them struggling, goes into the storm, walks on the water to them. It all happened right about where the hand is. And at, in, in the uh, whatever watch of the night, 4 a.m.-ish time frame, comes to them, walks on the water. Peter walks on the water. He calms the storm. They receive him into the boat. He calms the storm, and immediately they're back at Capernaum. That's all that story happened right here. So much of uh, the, the two and a half years, again, so much of what you read in the gospel narratives happens here. So let's look at, let's see some photos of Capernaum and the rest of Galilee. So the ruins of Capernaum are there today, and you can see basalt homes and foundations and the synagogue, and we gather our groups around and we teach and we talk through the miracles of Jesus that happened in this place. It is just amazing, all that they've excavated. So we're looking now towards the sea. This is a Catholic church that's been built over the site of the house of Peter. And this is one of those that actually it's, it's the real thing, okay? So there's a church there that, that dates back to the Byzantine era, which is like the second and third century. And in that church, they found inscriptions on the walls that said this is the house of Peter. And, and, and most believe that that's where Jesus lived when he was in Capernaum so that he stayed with Peter. So that's really cool. But you really can't hardly get to it. I mean, you just kind of stick your head in and take a photo because the church is built over it. Wasn't that nice of them? But just an amazing city. You get to the shoreline, it's very rocky. This was kind of an overcast day, so you can't really see the hills in the, in the distance. This is looking west. Mount Arbel is off to the west. Again, looking west on the shoreline. This is really cool, this is the synagogue. 100% yes, Jesus taught here. Um, the only thing that is from the first century is what's under what you're looking at. The foundation is basalt, so that dates back to the first century. This was rebuilt later, after the time of Jesus, but it is the synagogue that the centurion paid to have built. If you remember, please uh, heal his servant, he's good to us, he's been good to us. Um, and, uh, and then the leader of this synagogue, Jairus, Jesus raises his daughter. Um, that, that, that's, there's a lot of connection to the synagogue. Jesus comes back from the feeding of the 5,000 to this synagogue. They've just eaten all that bread and fish. He goes into the synagogue and teaches the message, I'm the bread of life. John uh, 6, the back half of John 6. And at that time, they rejected him. So this was towards the last part of the two and a half years. And there's like, this is a hard saying, who can bear it? And many walked away. And he, Jesus is left sitting there with his disciples. Lots of people have rejected him, and he says, will you also go away? 
And that's where they say, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So at this point, um, let me just show you a few more photos and then we'll go north. I'm running out of time, 10 more minutes. More ruins, that's the house under the, the house of Peter under the church. More seashore, more seashore. Okay, this is looking, um, looking kind of southeast. And this is the hill where, you can barely see it in the distance, but this is the hill where it might have worked for the swine to go off. Okay. Uh, that's a little better shot. You can see the hills. Oh, what did I just do? Okay. Beautiful, isn't it? So this is looking west, and it's a little bit. I don't know what to do, Brent. Well, let's try this. If you're on live stream, I apologize. Bear with us. Come on. Maybe this is just God saying, it's lunchtime. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Not lunchtime. <laughs> Okay, Capernaum, let's go north quickly. Ah, man, I'm, I wish I had a little more time. We're, we're gonna have to do this again. All right, at this point in the ministry of Jesus, his ministry in Galilee is pretty much wrapped up. They've heard the gospel numerous times. People have made their minds up. He takes his disciples north. They journey up this uh, that beautiful valley, there's a lot of hills going up, and this is called the Upper Galilee. You break into this upper valley that's pretty wide. You know, on one side you've got Lebanon, on the other side you've got Syria. It's amazing. And you go as far north as you can go in the modern day country, and you come to this area right here, which is called Dan, and Caesarea Philippi, where the hand is, and the peak of Mount Hermon. So what is significant about this, Dan is an, Old, is an Old Testament city that used to be called Laish. The tribe of Dan didn't like their allotment. They went off into idolatry and against the will of God and the plan of God, they went north and conquered this peaceful city of people and renamed their city Dan. And then later in their history in the Northern Kingdom, this is where Jeroboam set up an altar and the nation was in paganism. This is right next to, I mean, it's just a few minutes away from a site called Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus took his disciples at the base of Mount Hermon. It's a Roman city, but it's at the site of an ancient cult worship site. And the, the storyline is that, well, I don't have time to go into all that. Jesus takes his disciples there to this place called Caesarea Philippi, and it was called the Gates of Hell. Um, this is the site at the base of Mount Hermon and built into that hillside was a cultic ritual site built into that space right there it's, it's just a cavern that was called the gates of hell they believed, ancient peoples for many centuries believed this to be a portal to the unseen realm, to the spirit realm. And there's reasons that go back to Genesis of why they believed that, um, that I don't have time to talk about. The site, this is an artist rendering of what the site would have looked like at the time. So you can see the temples, and this would have been a terrible, terrible place. Child sacrifice, uh, a bloody place, a fornicating place, it was terrible. Uh, totally satanic. So about the time everybody's turning away from Jesus except for his small group of followers, they're getting discouraged because they think he's gonna set up a geopolitical kingdom. So he takes them to this place. This is where he sits them down and says, who do you say that I am? And they said, you're the Christ. And he said, upon this rock, this confession, I'm gonna build my church. What is he he's saying? Guys, don't worry, it's not game over. We're right on schedule. I'm building not 
a geopolitical kingdom. I'm gonna build a church. The kingdom's gonna look different than you think it is. And then he says, the gates of hell will not prevail. He's talking about this, the, 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 the paganism of the world, Satan will not prevail. And I love the idea that gates are defensive measure, so when we say the gates will not prevail, the church is on the offense. The church is victoriously triumphing, marching forward, and, and hell loses, and Satan knows that. So he took them there for a very specific reason, to, to let them know that what they think is gonna happen is not gonna happen. And in every gospel, this is where you read, he begins to tell them of his death. They don't like to hear that, they don't understand it, they don't know how to process it, but for three, three different occasions in multiple gospels, he tells them, we're gonna go back and I'm gonna be crucified, so, so buckle up and get ready. This is also the site where he begins to teach them, if you lose your life for my sake in the gospels, you'll find it. That whole idea of suke, losing your suke, Jesus saying, hey, follow me. This, this is not just salvation and, and forgiveness of sins and a new kingdom, this is discipleship. And salvation's free, but discipleship is all in. Like, I wanna be a follower of Jesus. So he's having that conversation at this location. So I'll just show you some more shots of this location, just remnants of pagan altars. And, uh, and then connected to this site was the remnants of Caesarea Philippi, which was where there's a palace of Herod in that location. It's kind of a gateway out of the road from Damascus down into, in, towards Jerusalem. So it's a strategic location. I took a picture of that bridge because that bridge is, the, is part of the old road to Damascus. So we know that somebody named Paul, Saul was on that road going to Damascus. And Damascus is just over the hill from all of this. These are the ruins of Herod's palace. This is more of the cult site, Herod's palace, looking up towards Mount Hermon. More palace. This is up in the Golan Heights looking back towards Galilee. From the Golan Heights looking down. You can understand why Israel in modern day had to recapture the Golan Heights because they're just sitting ducks. They're target practice. Um, Syria had all these missile and, and gun up on those hills and just, just lobbing them right down into the villages and the farms in, in Galilee. So it was a dangerous place to live. They, they really strategically needed to capture that. Okay, this is looking up towards Mount Hermon. And the cult site of Caesarea Philippi is right up in here. And Mount Hermon, is, the peak is right there. Okay, I'm gonna zip out of this because I wanna... <clears throat> Man, this is a bummer. All right, what do I wanna show you before we go? I wanna show you... I already showed you Capernaum. This is the, the hill above uh, Capernaum where, where we believe Jesus taught the Beatitudes. So that's one season, same spot, another season. Look how green it is and how different. I wanna point something out too. These are banana fields. And they just grow a bunch and bunch of bananas. And ever since day one at Emmanuel, we give all of our first time guests a loaf of banana bread. And I never knew how biblical that really was. <laughs> So this is all Mount Beatitudes, looking down on the seashore. Sunset, that's Mount Arbel. Magdala is down here. We're looking kind of south, uh, southwest. Love this spot. Now we're, not, now we're looking southeast. This is a little cave up above Capernaum. We just thought it was kind of interesting. One of my guides is, is like 100% positive that's where Jesus trained his disciples. I don't know that he has any information to validate that with, but, but he's pretty sure that's, that that cave was where they went for their solitary place. Um, the trail from Chorazin to Bethsaida, this is the ruins of, of the village of Chorazin. This is a mikvah, which is a cleansing pool, looks a lot like a baptistry, kind of cool. This was the synagogue in Chorazin. And then we did the hike that goes down to Capernaum. It was just so cool. I mean, just taking that walk for an hour and a half or two hours, Jesus and his disciples absolutely did that. Um, 
Okay, so what do I need to do? I'm, I, I do, I'm gonna show you a few more sites related to Jesus' final days, and then we'll go eat lunch, okay? We're gonna, we are gonna have to do this again. You guys okay with that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let me uh, just spin this a little bit. So, Jesus' last week of life, if I can just walk you through it very quickly, uh, his, his last six months, he goes back through Samaria and back through um, Judea. He sends out 70. And he does one more gospel campaign through Judea, and he ends up back here in Bethabara or Bethabara. Uh, that's, this is where the rich young ruler came to him. A lot of the... A lot of the latter part, the last half of Luke is the Judean, the, the last six months, the Judean campaign out of Galilee into Judea. So he ends up over here, um, and his last week of life, he crosses over, comes through Jericho, heals two blind men, one of them is named Bartimaeus, and he has set his face, Luke says in chapter nine, steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, now it's time. And he's been on a very specific mission uh, he's got an appointment on a cross in Jerusalem on a Friday morning of Passover. It's a very specific time, and it's, and it's the fullness of time, as God says. So Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, and he stays in Bethany. Bethany is... Remember how we were looking at uh, the old city? Okay, here it is. Here's Temple Mount right here. Bethany is over the hill, over the Mount of Olives, right here in this area. So at one point he went and raised Lazarus and then went back to Bethabara. Remember how he didn't show up for a few days and Lazarus died? They knew where he was and he didn't come. Why? Because he wanted to resurrect Lazarus. That happens just shortly before he comes back through Jericho. But his last week of life, he's staying in Bethany and he goes into Temple Mount. He goes down the Mount of Olives every day into the temple grounds and he preaches and interacts and, and, and does uh, miracles and, and again appealing to his enemies that they, would, um, that they would repent and kind of his last call, his last appeal. So that week, to and from, to and from, there's like, like Wednesday is a, or Thursday morning is a day of rest. Thursday night is the last supper. So Sabbath begins at sundown. So Jesus comes from Bethany. And by the way, the beginning of that week on um, Sabbath was, uh, was, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. The, the, the Sunday after Sabbath was when he did the triumphal, triumphal entry. The triumphal entry goes, this is the peak of the Mount of Olives. So it comes over this peak and then down this hill past the Garden of Gethsemane and around to these to the pool of, of uh, Siloam and then up the processional to, into the city. So the palm branches and the people waving and it starts outside of the city and goes, goes down. I really wanna show you some pictures of that valley if I can. Mount of Olives. So this is the Mount of Olives looking from the city of David. So we're looking west the peak of the Mount of Olives, and the road comes down this way. Garden of Gethsemane is right down here. This is the corner of Temple Mount. So now we're on the Mount of Olives looking across the valley at Temple Mount. That's the shot you've all seen a million times, right? Um, so we're standing on, on the Mount of Olives looking across the Kidron Valley towards Temple Mount. So the city of David is off to the left, the upper room is up over in this area, up, up here. Um, and then the old city, western wall is behind that. All right, looking back, Mount of Olives. We've, we've come across now. That's Mount of Olives. This is Temple Mount, Southern Steps. And we're looking the other way to Temple Mount. I hope I'm not losing you, I'm trying to hurry. Okay, just to give you an orientation, this is the southern, Southern steps of the temple were right here. The palace of David would have been right here. The city of David extends out here. The, the Kidron Valley, you can't see it. It's over the ridge. And then the Mount of Olives goes up, up that, uh, that direction. 
This is the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, if I can go back to Google Earth, so the peak of the Mount of Olives, the road comes down, there's a massive cemetery that they built, basically the entire Mount of Olives is a cemetery because they all wanna be first when the Messiah comes. Um, he sets down on the Mount of Olives and goes through the Eastern Gate. They all want to be resurrected and be in the front of the line. It's very Jewish of them to, to think of that that way. Traditionally and culturally and politically, I'm talking about in his, historical means. I'm not trying to speak to uh, any ethnic disparity. Um, they just, they want to be the first with their Messiah. So Gethsemane is right here, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit into this valley area. So Kidron Valley is right here. It goes all the way along Temple Mount and around the bend. You can see the walls of Temple Mount. It's very steep. Uh, so Jesus comes into the city, teaches, goes out back and forth for three or four days. Thursday night, he goes to the upper city to have his, his last supper with his disciples, which is uh, up, up this direction. Here it is. Up, up in this upper city here. He then goes down the hill, probably down a stair, some staircases to the bottom of this valley, up the Kidron Valley, which was much like a garden, it wasn't like all this, up to the Garden of Gethsemane where the Bible says he oft resorted thither. He prays, he begins to suffer. Caiaph, uh, not Caiaph, Judas betrays, they send the Roman, uh, not the Roman guards, the Jewish uh, soldiers and guards to the Garden of Gethsemane to get him. So I wanna go back to Garden of Gethsemane pictures. This is a private area that's been roped off, but this is where I like to go. Like, we don't take groups here. This is like a spot that I found off the beaten path. Um, I just did some wandering on my own and found a little opening and, and went wandering. So these olive trees, did they go back to first century? No, but it's, this, is, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where Jesus went to pray often and then the night before he was crucified. But I, the thing I think is amazing is right there in the valley, the Kidron Valley, looking up at the Eastern Gate, up at Temple Mount, it's just so central. It's also the valley of Shave where Abraham met Melchizedek and the king of Sodom and had to choose which one he would be loyal to. That's in Genesis 14. Really cool story. But to think about, thousands of years ago, Abraham has a test of faith here, and thousands of years later, Jesus is suffering for my sins and beginning his suffering here. It's amazing to connect all these dots. More Garden of Gethsemane. Again, climbing up the hill, the garden goes down towards the valley there. So, uh, that's Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is brought back up the hill over here to Caiaphas' house. I wanna show you Caiaphas' house. So this is the view from Caiaphas' house looking towards Temple Mount, looking down towards the, the Valley of Kidron, and the Garden of Gethsemane is where the arrow is, and then uh, Mount of Olives is up here to the, to the right. Caiaphas' house has been excavated only so far. There's the stairs that come up and down from his house. So Jesus was walked up these stairs and back down uh, to take him uh, to Pilate or to Herod. I just, those stairs, I just couldn't get enough of them. This is the dungeon, this is the, this is the holding cell under Caiaphas' house. It's very small, it's very dark. Uh, it's cut into the rock. So think about this. The highest religious leader of the day had a holding cell under his house where they tied up Jesus while they were deciding what to do with him. So he's arrested. He's held in here. There's, there's places, you know, the ropes are not that old, but the hole where they tie the ropes so they can string up the prisoners are here still to this day. So Jesus is then, uh, I'm just gonna very quickly track with you on, on, on your um, geography here. He's taken from Caiaphas to Pilate. Pilate was one of two places. He's either over here at Antonia Fortress or up over here at Herod's palace. And you can see that on your, on your, on your map, okay? But he's taken from the Sanhedrin at Caiaphas' house to Pilate 
Pilate doesn't want to kill him. He sends him to Herod. Herod laughs at him, sends him back, says, this is your problem. Pilate has him scourged. Uh, it, that could have happened at Antonian Fortress. That's where the soldiers would have resided. Um, and then releases him to be crucified. At that point, Jesus is marched out of the city, either this way up to the garden tomb, uh, to Calvary, or this way. So this is Temple Mount, Antonian Fortress is here. So he's either carried over here to be crucified or he's marched out here to be crucified. So I wanna show you the garden tomb, um, Golgotha and the garden tomb. Okay, here it is. So Golgotha today, the place of the skull, this is what it looks like today. It's literally an Arab bus station. But the rock behind those buses is where the face of the skull used to be, and this was a quarry, and it, it was shaped like a skull. This, is, this next photo is a photo that was taken in the late 18, or early 1900s, and this is the road to Damascus coming out of the city. This is the quarry, and you can see the face. The nose is gone at this point, but there used to be a nose and the two eye sockets. This was a skull feature in this rock. That's why I tend to like this place. Well, the garden, the, 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 the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, if that's where he was crucified, there's just no visual uh, way to see any of that. It's a church and, it, and it's all in the middle of the city. Uh, but this is still there, it's just, sorry, it's just like that now. And the eye sockets were somewhere over in here and then it's, it's kind of deteriorated. So um, this is located just outside the Damascus Gate, it would have been on the road to Damascus. Uh, right here in the middle of all this city is this little area, and that rock that we were just looking at is right a, a part of this bus station that you can see. And then the garden tomb, and this is, it matches perfectly the gospel descriptions. And we'll end with the resurrection here. If you're looking at Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull, and you turn, and you walk two minutes, I mean you walk 50, 60 yards, you're now in this garden area and you come up against a rock cliff, it's all built up around, but you come up against a rock cliff that is a tomb. And it's been modified since the first century, but in its original form it dates back to the first century. And you can see the natural rock and, and um, the entrance to the tomb, and they've made it a very nice place to visit now. They've, they've found a, a wine press. This was obviously a garden, olive trees, and it fits the, perfectly to the description of where Jesus was crucified and how, how in the place he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden there was a tomb. Um, and then when you go in that tomb, you can see where it's been hewn out, and it's empty. It's empty. <laughs> Um, and this is another thing why I like the garden tomb. That's a Byzantine etching on the wall of that tomb. That goes back to third century church, Christian church. And so they, apparently, they thought this was the tomb. So again, you, you, you can get online and, and do your work and figure out you know, which, which site you like to be the tomb. But Jesus was crucified and then buried, um, and we know the rest of the story. So, there is so much that I didn't tell you. But I went over time and I'm sorry. What's new? Even you give me three hours and I still am gonna take more time. <laughs> See, it's, I'm an addict. I could teach the Bible forever. So here's what we'll do. In a minute, we'll dismiss for lunch. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions during lunch. We're gonna, are we eating in the lobby here, Stephen? Oh, we're eating downstairs, okay. Uh, we have lunch for everybody, so we hope you'll stay. If you're a guest, we, you're welcome to stay, and we hope that our church family will get to know you. Um, happy to answer any questions. I think we've got sandwiches and stuff. I will, I, I will schedule another one of these. I don't know when. We'll look at the calendar, and we'll do the same thing. We'll do 9 to noon, and uh, next time we'll switch up lunch. Maybe we'll do pizza or something. But I think for that one, what we'll do is we'll start with the Exodus um, and talk about... Uh, Zion, I mean, uh, Sinai and all that. That's really cool. And then I'd like to do Journeys of Paul. So I'd like to take you out of the book of 
Luke and John and into the book of Acts across the Mediterranean and talk about um, Paul's journeys. We'll, we'll do the same thing, Google Earth, and we'll show you pictures of the different sites that we've been to. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with the churches of Revelation, the seven churches of Asia Minor. And then you can literally say, you've covered the whole Bible. So um, beautiful land, amazing, amazing what God has done for us and how he has validated our faith. So did you enjoy this? Thank you. So if you're online, um, go eat lunch and enjoy your afternoon and we'll keep you posted on the next time we do this. Thank you for joining us. So let's pray and let's go eat. I know everyone's hungry. Lord Jesus, we love you and thank you for the, just the great morning we've had. Uh, I hope everybody's had half as good a time as I've had. I just have loved talking about you and about your life and uh, the land that you call yours. And um, I know sooner or later, we'll all get to visit this land. Um, and I'd, I'd rather it be sooner after the rapture and at the end of time because it'll be a lot more peaceable and beautiful at that point and free. But Lord, either way, take us back and give us opportunity to visit uh, again. And I pray that you bless the food and the fellowship over the next uh, 45 minutes or an hour and just give us a great time together. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we'll see you downstairs. If you're new and don't know where to go, somebody will direct you, but straight to the window and downstairs.